All right, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Welcome to another amazing Saturday session. So I have to open up with, of course, the biggest miracle we probably have experienced in the last 25, 30 years. <laughs> um, so I was holding up this, like, can anyone see like what this is? Okay, it's a water bottle, okay? <laughs> a water bottle. It has electrolytes in it and it's replacing the Diet Coke today, the Coke Zero. Alhamdulillah. So, I mean, people who have been writing to us online, people who've known us for ages, who always come and say, why does Sheikh drink so much Coke Zero? Please don't, please get him to stop. It's unhealthy, all of this kind of thing. I don't know what happened. I mean, we're all like kind of scratching our head because a lot of us sort of gave up like decades ago. We, you know, we keep trying, but Alhamdulillah, we had a miracle. And for some reason, uh, it must be the Kron Project, must be the Project Illumin, um, that Sheikh um, decided to try having this with electrolytes in it. Um, and he, alhamdulillah, has been like replacing his um, Coke Zero consumption with it. And we were so excited because it's made a difference in, in every single way. And not the least of which is our, like everyone who's here is just jumping for joy. So anyway, thank you for everyone's prayers. I know people have been praying about this for decades. So finally God answered your prayers. And inshallah, may this lead to, you know, a very, very long, fruitful, productive, you know, life. Um, I, well, you know, he, he doesn't like when I make that prayer. Um, he used to make that prayer for his mom and she used to be like what you want me to be a corpse um <laughs> but if at a minimum if each day is more healthy more productive you know more hydrated um that's all good so you know of course all of these things are left in the last hands but it's alhamdulillah alhamdulillah you know we have to do our part so um thank you everyone who ever made a prayer for for water <laughs> um and I guess the only other thing that I actually just wanted to share something which um, was sort of striking to me in our reflection group um, last night, we talked about Dariyat and Fusilat, um, which were incredible surahs. I mean, every surah is incredible, what can you say? You know, there are just no words to really describe, but each one has a very important lesson. And it struck me as someone was um, sharing last night um, that, you know, I, when I was not a Muslim, um, I think my approach to life was very passive. Like oftentimes, you know, your day was really um, affected and your emotions were really affected by just whatever happened in the course of a day. And you were just sort of, I was reactive. I was just sort of hoping and praying that each day would be good and something would happen. Um, and then, you know, but in general, it was just a very passive, reactive um, sort of existence. And, you know, you take that in contrast to the things that we've been learning here, um, you know, when we read the Quran about everything being, you know, about being in motion and working hard and, you know, and having a very, you know, mindful attitude towards, um, you know, justice and truth and how to, you know, produce goodness and kindness and all of this. It changes your entire focus from passivity to um, one of action. Um, and even like in the khutbah that the professor gave yesterday, if you hadn't have a haven't had a chance to watch it, you know, the idea that whenever we make a choice, any choice, there is no such thing as something that's neutral. When you're making a choice, whether it's, you know, everything from what you eat to what you wear to how you treat others to, you know, how you think about anything, you're actively making a choice either towards the divine or towards the demonic. And there's very little that is, is neutral. Um, and so, you know, this is a really important lesson that I know it took me many years early on in my journey to finally figure out, like something finally clicks with you. This is one thing to think about being active, you know, it's like, okay, we want to fight for justice, we want to fight for truth. So you naturally think, okay, I'm going to go to a protest, I'm going to go whatever, you know, you're going to go do something that requires some physical activity. You're going to write a letter, you're going to call someone. But the thing that is oftentimes missed is what happens emotionally. And how do you move emotionally from passivity to action? Because, you know, we talk a lot here about the importance of patience, the importance of perseverance, the importance of, um, you know, or kindness or good, having good thoughts or just or not being angry and not being irritated. And these are things that, that are internal to you. And so naturally you would tend to think, okay, these are sort of passive things. I hope, you know, I'm feeling irritated. I'm hoping it'll eventually go away. I feel like angry at someone. I just need time and it'll pass. And the truth of the matter is no, it's something that actually requires 
active engagement and an active decision making process. So if you are feeling like, you know, you need patience, it's not just taking time, distracting yourself, watching a Netflix show, hoping that you'll feel better after you take a nap. No, you have to actually make the active decision to be patient, to be to persevere, to think good thoughts, to, you know, if you're feeling irritated, to tell yourself not to feel irritated because those choices that you make you know, definitely are a decision towards the divine or the demonic, and on, on, oftentimes even a lack of a decision. If you're saying, I'm not going to do anything, I'm just going to wait it out, sleep it out, hope it out, that is inaction, and that is neutral. I mean, that, that by definition is sort of a, a decision, non-action towards the demonic. And so I think that, you know, it, it finally, it took a long time for something to actually click with me. But this is a point of empowerment, you know? It's, it's like when you actually re realize you have the decision-making power in your hands, right? God gave us choice. That's what we keep learning time and time again. It is your choice how you want to feel about something. It is your choice how you act. It's not, you know, it's not like, okay, I'm angry and, uh, you know, I don't like it, so I'm, you know, whatever. It requires hard work. It requires intentionality and it requires sometimes, you know, just an active fight. You know, I'm not going to allow myself to continue feeling this way. And it takes time. You know, I mean, obviously, if something happens and you're angry, it takes some time to calm down. But imagine the amount of time it takes to get over it when you're passive versus when you're active. And you can make, you know, and you're making a decision and saying, okay, I want to make a godly decision, a divine decision, because God wants us to be in, you know, in a state of goodness and creating goodness. And it's impossible to create goodness when you're feeling angry and upset and negativity. Um, so it's, you know, it's something to just really reflect upon. Um, and it's exciting because it's the power of your own decision making. It's the power of, you know, you taking the control and saying, I, I am not going to allow myself to, you know, feel the negativity for any, mo any moment longer than I have to. And, um, and I think that that's a really important lesson to, to internalize. Um, and it, it becomes a habit also. Um, because you, I think that for many, many years, I mean, for the vast majority of my life, I really felt powerless and helpless to these kinds of emotions and things that would make me feel bad. Um, and when I learned that, no, I'm not powerless. I, it's not something, I'm not the victim. I'm not someone who has to accept what someone does to me, you know, and, and, and have it affect my entire day or week or year or my, you know, and my entire outlook on life. No, I, I'm going to fight this with everything that I have, you know, and the lessons we learned about, you know, addressing evil with goodness, um, you know, with anything bad with good, replacing, you know, repelling evil with bad, um, or, you know, ignorance with enlightenment, you know, all of the things that we, we learned in the surahs that we've been covering. Um, it, it's, it's such an incredible change of life perspective that, that really um, just illuminates everything, changes how you feel inside, um, lightens your soul, and I think allows us to really internalize the lessons from the Quran. So um, that is it. And I am looking forward to another amazing um, halakha today is, is a difficult surah, um, of course, um, all of them are, but you know, I think as we're like getting deeper and deeper in, each one is more and more challenging. And certainly, Sheikh was up um, very late preparing and up very early preparing. So, um, inshallah, may Allah bless the session and be with us and help us to learn what we need to learn. Thank you. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen wa subhanallah al-Aliya al-Azim wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barik ala Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi wa tawab ihsanan ila yawm al-Din wa mashuh li sadri wa yassir li amri wa ahmi muqlatan min lisani yafqaw qawli Inshallah today we will talk about Surah Ibrahim but before we do that um Yesterday in the uh, in the review session during the discussion, I I I just remembered that there is something in Surah Al-Araf that I forgot to uh, talk about. Um, Subhanallah, just just completely escape escape me uh, so this is from 
last week's surah, surah al-Araf, and the the point is actually <laughs> interestingly enough, it's actually a really important point and a big point. Um, it has to do with Ayah 164. So, وَإِذَا قَالَتْ أُمَّةٌ مِّنْهُمْ لِمَا تَعْجِدُونَ قَوْمًا اللَّهُ مُهْلِكَهُمْ أَوْ مُعَذِّبُهُمْ عَذَابًا شَدِيدًا قَالُوا مَعْذِرَةً إِلَى رَبِّكُمْ وَلَعَلَّهُمْ يَتَّقُونَ So, you, you recall in Surah Al-A'raf, the, the, um, the central theme has to do with those who are in the status of the A'raf, uh, those who are, uh, have, were, capable of recognizing what's right and wrong, but did nothing, or were couch-type people. They, they were inactive. And as a result, they, they come in the hereafter, and they're really stuck between um, being saved and being damned. And part of the important theme of Surat al-Araf is that Surat al-Araf focuses on the legacy of the Israelites and the various stages that the Israelites go through. And as we've discussed, that um, there is a considerable amount of nuance in that sometimes there are among the Israelites after Moses السلام, among the Israelites there are those that um, um, surrender to their most base desires and become as if the the moral equivalent of apes um, and there are those that live by principle, and and so they have a very different status. And among, of course, the images of Surat al-Araf is the panting dog, or those who live enslaved to their desires, um, and they're constantly panting after something or another. And their entire life becomes this this obsession with uh, coveting and consuming and panting. And in the context of speaking about the, the, the legacy of the Israelites, um, Surat al-Araf talks about that uh, the, among, when the Israelites have divided into tri 12 tribes and Moses performs a miracle of um, uh, 12 springs for 12, 12 tribes, which I've mentioned in the, in the last halakha, and slowly after Moses passes away, uh, among those 12 tribes, there are those that um, drift away from the original message and forget uh, the, the, in their, their relationship with Allah and um, end up uh, surrendering to a life of luxury and entitlement and start, as a result, deviating and becoming corrupt. And Surah Al-Araf speaks about the response of a group of, we can call them a group of reformers, a group of people who see that their, uh, their community is going the wrong direction. And they consistently try to speak to their community, try to advocate or try to appeal to their community. Um, 
protesting that they are drifting away from the original principles that were brought to them by Musa alayhi salam. Uh, of course, core to these principles are the commandments. Because as we know from Surah Al-Araf, that the, Surah Al-Araf tells us that Musa was given the commandments which he brought to the Israelites and it became an ethical code for them to focus their lives around. And the the point that I forgot to talk about was that um, the Quran tells us that as these group of reformers are consistently logging heads with their community and meeting resistance by their community, there is a, a, a hypothetical question. It doesn't tell us who uh, asked that question. It, it simply poses it as a, a theoretical construct, if you will. And it asks, it says, and, and so they are asked, they are the reformers. Why do you keep trying to advocate, why do you keep trying to change the people who are doomed? So it gets to the heart of the matter that you you keep trying to reform and you're getting zero response. And you know that these people are on their way to being ruined, either ruined on this earth or in the hereafter or both, uh, because of their immorality and because they have abandoned the ethical path that Allah has laid out before them. And the response that Surah Al-Araf gives us is very significant. And it says that, well, so that, so that we will vindicate ourselves before our Lord. So the, the construct of this ayah communicates that although the group of reformers, and we are not, the, naming the group of reformers is not important. And I think that it, it, it is all, um, you know, it could apply to any group of reformers in any, in any such situation. Uh, the, they are aware the, the, the way that this narrative that is constructed allows us to understand that these reformers are aware that their efforts are effectively futile and that they're not going to they're not achieving any results and that in fact they're not going to make a difference empirically in the fate of their people but that the way they understand their role is that they don't have a choice but to do what they do. And that they have to do it not because of the empirical, possible empirical results, because if they look at that, they in fact would stop doing anything, but simply as a way of discharging their obligations before God. And of course, the the significance of this is that everything that the Quran says, it is talking to Muslims. You know, although in the you know telling narratives about Israelites, that don't think about the empirical results. Only think about the ethical obligations. It is not for you to think of, well, how successful is this? But it is, the, the sole question is, what is the moral obligation, obligation before me? And that should define your conduct, not 
measurements of whether change is realistic or not realistic or whether it's worth your time or not worth your time if it's if, if it is a moral obligation placed upon you by God then it is worth your time and you do it for Allah's sake not for the sake of anything else uh, and obviously this was like one of the the important points that um, that adds to the central theme of Surat Al-Araf. So I'm, I'm rather surprised that I forgot it um, because of its significance. Um, and, you know, the interesting thing is that although in, in so many of the tafsir, they, they note everyone noticed the response of this group um, you know that they respond Mazira Lillah that it is it is it, it, we continue doing what we're doing to discharge our obligations before God but subhanAllah sometimes human beings get sort of an epistemological block. An epistemological block is when, you know, you are prevented from taking the next logical step because of your stage, stages of human con development in human consciousness or because of cultural habits or because of sociological realities you can't you can't break you can't think outside of the box that has been set for you so so many of us here would know that this is the response but they wouldn't take the next logical step of saying well then the the question is always what is your moral obligation not what are the consequences. Um, you, you are only you should only be concerned with your ethical duty. But it needs to be stated in that stark and simple fashion, because it is obvious. I mean, again, it is when you go back to Surah Al-Araf, and you see that the entire structure of the surah is focused on this essential moral paradigm. Okay, subhanAllah. All right, so inshallah now let's move to Surah Ibrahim. Surah Ibrahim, it's another Mecca Surah, and every authority that I am aware of agreed that it is among the very late Meccan surahs, it was among the last surahs or the final surahs to be revealed in Mecca. So it was revealed sometime shortly before the Hijra. Uh, according to some authorities, the, the Hijra had even started when Surah Ibrahim was revealed, meaning that there had already been people who had migrated to Medina, although the Prophet والسلام, and uh, Abu Bakr Siddiq and Ali bin Abi Talib uh, were were still in Mecca. Regardless, it, 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 so it's uh, it's one of the very late Meccan surahs. And not surprisingly, uh, this is um, we find this connected to the message of Surah Ibrahim. Now, we, we, of course, we know that Ibrahim as a prophet, his story is mentioned in many different places in the Quran. And, um, but, this is the surah that gets named after him. 
And it is logical to think or to ask, why were the early Muslims, why did they think that this is the surah that should be named after the Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam? Um, so we'll come back to this point because it's an important one. So Surah Ibrahim starts with Alif Lam Ra, and we've talked about these letters before. It is one of the six surahs in the in the Quran that starts with Alif Lam Ra, and in in the way that the Quran is currently organized, I believe it would be the fifth. In, of the six surahs that are that start with Alif Lam Ra, I'm, I'm you know not a hundred percent sure if it's the fifth, but I think it would be the fifth. Um, and we know that generally we we've talked about the Hawamin, but the Alif Lam Ra. Sur. You, if you go back and you study the six sur that start with Alif Lam Ra, all of them have to do with um, social structure. All of them have to do with building of a virtuous society, not a utopia. I mean, I, I, I don't think that the Quran ever talks about a utopia. And I don't think that the concept of a utopia actually exists in the Quranic imagination. But if you would attempt a virtuous society, what were would be some of the essential building blocks and we find this common to all the alif lam ra sur and surah ibrahim has a it, it's a, on the one hand a, a rather um pungent, powerful, uh, uh, um, right-to-the-point message about that. But yet, as we will see, there are numerous or several ethical nuances that uh, exist throughout the surah that deserve our attention. كتاب أنزلناه إليك لتخرج الناس من الظلمات إلى النور بإذن ربهم إلى صراط العزيز الحميد. So the surah takes us to what will be in fact the central theme in Surah Ibrahim, taking people out of darkness. من الظلمات إلى النور and out of darkness to light and it starts out with the situating the purpose of this book of the Quran is to take people out of darkness in the plural ظلمات so several or 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 a multitude of darkness or different types of darkness to the light um rabbihim ila sirat al aziz al hamid bi rabbihim through 
uh, literally, it would be through the license of the, your Lord or the leave of your Lord or the permission of your Lord. But in the construction in this context, the Ibn Rabbihim implies immediately that that process of taking people out of darkness to light cannot be achieved without the intimate involvement of your Lord. In other words, you need Allah's barakah, you need Allah's blessings, you need Allah to be by your side in order to achieve the purpose of the book. So the book is not an automatic machine. It's not that we're going to bring the book and implement the book regardless of our ethical state or moral state, we will achieve light. But as we encountered before, that the book itself needs fertile ground. That it needs to be planted on ethical soil. And if the ethical soil is not there, then you might not have Allah's aid and support. And then it just the equation doesn't work. Okay, and we will see that this theme of darkness to light will be repeated again with Moses, Musa alayhi salam, um, tying it to the to the message of Surat Ibrahim. Okay, الذين يستحبون الحياة الدنيا على الآخرة. ويصدون عن سبيل الله ويبغونها عوجا أولئك في ضلال بعيد وما أرسلنا من رسول إلا بلسان قومه ليبين لهم فيضل الله من يشاء ويهدي من يشاء وهو العزيز الحكيم and then five ولقد أرسلنا موسى بآياتنا أنخرج أنخ أنخرج قومك من من الظلمات إلى النور وذكرهم بأيام الله إن في ذلك لآيات لكل صبار شكور. Okay, so after the opening ayah, Verse 2 and verse 3, the important point here is that that expression, يَسْتَحِبُّونَ الْحَيَاةَ الدُّنْيَا عَلَى الْآخِرَةَ So, already in the first verse, we, have, we, we should be asking, what is the darkness that Surat Ibrahim is referring to. What is the nature of this darkness that is an unacceptable situation? And that as we will see, both Ibrahim السلام, and Musa السلام, have to contend with, and by implication then Muhammad السلام, has to contend with. And we are given the the first hint or the first step towards understanding the the type of problem that Surat Ibrahim is treating in the, the expression yastahibun al hayat al dunya yastahibun um It's 
best way to translate it, um, the study Quran says, Oh, the study Quran says those who prefer the life of this world over the hereafter. Istanbul is, is not just prefer the life of this world. Um, they, istihbab is is where your, your inclinations, your hawa, your um, your impulses develop a habitual preference to something. So you, it is like you have no space in your heart in your hawa, in your in 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 the nervous system that defines what attracts you, you have no space for the moral truth uh, that the hereafter represents. What attracts you consistently are things that have to do with life on this earth. As People like Arazi pointed out that it could be that you just don't think about the hereafter very much, or it could be that you don't, you haven't spent much time in worship, so you have no hereafter consciousness, or as some of the Sufi Askhafasir point out that. A heart empty of dhikr is a heart that will always struggle with being attracted to the affairs of, to the worldly affairs. For the many different reasons that are possible, but you are, what you think about day in and day out, what gets the most gets the the gets it the the, a, the most genuine reaction out of you are things that have to do with life on this earth whether it's a positive reaction or a negative reaction so what upsets you the most are things that go wrong on life on this earth or what makes you happy the most are things that go right or, uh, life on this earth that's is hayat al dunya that but it you don't react the same way to things that have to do with the hereafter. Okay. وَيَصُدُّونَ عَنْ سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ وَيَبْغُونَ عِوَجَ Now, and الصد عَنْ سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ is to develop an obstructionist attitude towards the path to God. And in fact, the, you are uncomfortable with the idea of the straight path. It, it, it's a type of personality that is made squeezy, uncomfortable, unhappy, resistant when they find those on the straight path or those that seem to them like too straight too too um uh you know too too clean and instead of being com comforted by that or attracted by that in fact they become the they cringe and there is a big grammatical debate about the wow here is this this the where the uh, the the wall that letter the harf is it saying that they have this consistent inclination to everything that has to do with life on this earth and in addition to that 
is it, and they also try to obstruct and prevent people from following the path of the Lord because they are averse to it, because they've developed an aversion to it? Or is it saying, talking about three categories of three different problems? Um, and I tend to think that it is not, it is not, it is not talking about people who suffer from all three things. The, the three things being that they they are inclined towards life on earth, and they obstruct the path, and they cringe from the straight path. Um, I think it is it is talking about alternatives. It's like saying if you have a pro, if if you are any of these three, you are part of the darkness paradigm. Uh, but there are many scholars that disagree with that. And many scholars say, no, it, it is talking about, it is, in addition to this, you are this and this and this. So it's, you know, you have to have the complete package before you're thought of as part of it. But, you know, the reason I, I th the reason I adopt the position I adopt is that Imagine if you're a person who your your sole problem is that you try to cre obstruct those on the straight path. Wouldn't you also be inclined to your your preferences be according to life of this earth, and wouldn't you also be somewhat averse to people on so? It doesn't, you know, to add it, uh, to read it as conjunctive in the sense of, it, you, in addition to this, you have to have this and you have to have that, doesn't make much sense. Because if you have one of these problems, it, you have a very big problem that is sort of all-encompassing. Uh, if, if when you meet people who are very honest or very... Um, ethical, you're turned off, and you sort of think, you know, oh, they're naive and stupid, I, I don't like them. Um, whether you intend to or not, you are an obstructionist in the path of your Lord. Whether you realize it or not, you are. And in addition to that, you are inclined towards everything that has to do with life on this earth. It, it, it is impossible that you have the hereafter as part of your consciousness and develop that type of aversion to ethical living. Um, so th that's why I, I take the position that I take. Okay. وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا مِنْ رَسُولٍ إِلَّا بِلِسَانِ قَوْمِ So... Verse 4, then again, as the Quran repeats several times, it is like justifying on the one hand why the Prophet ﷺ is speaking Arabic. Because notice that the beginning of Surah Ibrahim so that you will take all people out of darkness to light. Now, every time you talk about all people, so this is a universal message to all people. That always begs the question, well, why Arabic? But any language that the Quran would have been revealed in, it would have confronted the same question. So why that language? And the answer that the Quran always gives is that I always use the language of the prophet that I sent. It's the prophet that defines the language. So, you know, Moses had 
had his language, Isa had his language, Ibrahim had his language, any prophet that I send, I utilize the language of the prophet. There is um, something that I read and I was trying last night to locate it and I couldn't. I couldn't find it. And of course, I, I don't use the wizardry of computers, so I don't know. Uh, maybe computer people, you can find it. I don't know. Um, but uh, it said that there is a further reason um, Surat Ibrahim and I'm skipping ahead a little bit so I'll remind you when we get to this part but Surat Ibrahim alerts people that only Allah knows real lineage that there have been many generations that have come after prophets and it is no one has witnessed these generations but Allah and in the Islamic tradition there developed a discourse about called uh, the, the discourse on Kathib and Seb what that means is there used to be these experts, I, they still exist, but not like before, who are experts on lineage. They tell you, you know, which tribe came from which tribe, from which tribe, and so on. And Surah Ibrahim was often taken as a surah that is cited for the proposition of Kazib and Ansab, that those who claim to be experts on lineage are in fact liars. And there is a famous hadith attributed to Ali ibn Abi Talib where he meets a man and he said, this man tells him, I am an expert on Insab. And Ali ibn Abi Talib tells him, you have li you're a liar. And the man says, but I know all the Insab. I know all the lineage. And Ali ibn Abi Talib again says, you're a liar. And the man said, no, I do. And then Ali ibn Abi Talib cites, uh, recites Surat Ibrahim to you, as, and I'll show you which ayah he recites in a second, or in a little bit, um, um, to tell them that you're a liar. So how, how, is this, how is this related to Arabic? Okay. So from that Kazib al-Ansab proposition, an argument was made that of all the ethnicities of the Middle East, the Arab ethnicity of all of them was the least ethnic one. Meaning that by the time the Quran is revealed, no one really knows who is ethnically an Arab. Do you remember the hadith I read to you where the Prophet ﷺ says, whoever speaks Arabic is an Arab. And in that position that it's in fact that was the reality that had become established on the ground by the time the Quran is revealed. Arabic was no longer a language that connoted ethnicity, unlike Persian or Turkish or um, Coptic. Uh, but Arabic, basically, anyone that spoke Arabic or knew Arabic became an Arab, became called an Arab. So Egyptians became Arabs, Iraqis became Arabs, Syrians became Arabs, Yemenis were Arabs, Algerians were Arabs, anyone that knew Arabic was Arab. And that is a part of the reason that Allah chose Arabic in this passage that I'm, I'm referring to. That Allah chose a language 
that could not be racialized. As I said, you know, I was doing most of the research a long time ago, and I and I wish I wrote from which book I was copying. I had copied like a whole paragraph. Obviously, I was very impressed by what I read, but I didn't write where I was copying it from. And when I tried to find it last night, I, I was very tired. And after spending a couple of hours looking, I sort of just gave up. Uh, just out of sheer exhaustion. Um, so, I don't know. Uh, but inshallah, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll find it, inshallah. If, or if the computer people don't find it first. Uh, computer people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, um, so it's fascinating. I mean, it's a, it's a fascinating idea. If you don't, if if uh, you know, maybe maybe I wasn't copying the paragraph. Maybe I wrote it. Maybe I invented it, and then I imagined. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Who knows? Scholars do weird things. They're very exhausted. You know. um, okay, so, but, uh, so we are at a, uh, oh yeah, four. Okay, so, but the second part of Aya 4, which is also very interesting, and it, it, you find a lot of debates about this, which says, فَيَضُلُّ اللَّهُ مَا يَشَاءُ وَيَهْدِي مَا يَشَاءُ وَهُوَ الْعَزِيزُ الْحَكِيمُ Of course, this, uh, which says, um, that God leads astray whomsoever God wills and guides whomsoever God wills and God is the mighty and wise uh, this this part of the fourth verse uh, ha enters into these debates about predestination, and why you know I and uh, and which are intimately interconnected with debates about God's uh, justice. Um, I, I mean, I, I'm not very impressed by these debates uh, because I think belief in predestination in, in our day and age is um, is very irrational. Um, and I think Zamakhshari puts it the best when he says... Uh, and even I, I found the same thing in, in, uh, in non Mu'tazili, like in Mataridi himself, who says that Yudullah man athara asbab al dalal wa yahdi man athara asbab al huda. Meaning that this can only be understood as you make the choice as to whether you want guidance or you want the opposite of guidance. But if you want guidance, God aids you in the path of guidance. If you don't want guidance, then by Allah not aiding you, Allah leaving you to your own devices, your own choices, you have been led to the opposite of guidance. So, it, it, remember that among, and we'll see this in Surah Ibrahim in a second, that the many people, when they are confronted with their cho wrong choices, try to put the blame on God and say, well, you know, if God would have wanted, God would have guided us. But the response of the Quran to this is that Allah is never impressed by that response. Allah never says, yeah, it, it was my decision. 
And as al Matanidi says, in this is sufficient proof that Allah's will is entirely contingent on your will. Your will is what will define Allah's will when it comes to guidance or misguidance. Okay, so the first ayah starts out with that this book is to take people from darkness to light and then the fifth ayah, which brings in Musa alayhi salam, it goes back to the same central theme that the purpose of Musa's message and ayat that were given to Musa, the, the ayat, whether this ayat is the message itself or the ayat were the miracles of Musa, to bring his people out of darkness, min al-zulumat, again, darkness in the plural, to light. And then it says, وَذَكِّرْهُمْ بِأَيَّامِ اللَّهِ إِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ لَآيَاتٍ لِكُلِّ صَبَّارٍ شَكُورٍ So, the study Quran translates it as remind them of the days of God. Truly in that are signs for all who are patient, patient and thankful. Okay, let, let's pause for just a second. First, that expression, Ayyamilla, got a lot of attention in uh, the literary corpus of Islam because, as we said before, the expression yom in Arabic can connote days, but it can also connote a period of time that is unspecified. A yawm is just a period of time, not necessarily a 24-hour day. And because it can connote a period of time, it was used in pre-Quranic Arabic to refer so you could say um, like if you say ayyam uh, dur the days of hardship so you can then you are referring to a set of events that took place in a period of time whether you know what particular days these were or not. So, when it says, and remind them of ayyam to to sort of put the, 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 the entire discussion under a little bit of, to summarize it, that he, he, Musa is, alayhi salam, is being told to remind his people of both the difficulties, the trials and the tribulations and the blessings that they've gone through as in the period of time in which they were intimately involved with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, intimately involved, how? Intimately involved through the presence of Musa alayhi salam, who was in fact in contact with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, To reflect upon 
all we went through in order to understand that what the reason Musa was there والسلام, was to take them out of darkness to light. Now, and not to be missed, it's in, in the same ayah, it says, Inna fi ayatin li kulli sabbarin shakur. In this is a message. It first mentioned sabbar, those who are, sabbar is, a, is someone who is persist, persistently patient. And a shakur is a person who is persistently grateful, thankful. And it mentioned patience before gratitude. And um, in Quranic commentaries, in some Quranic commentaries, you'll find a discussion as to why patience was mentioned before gratitude. And the the uh, you know not all the discussions are are important, but those that are the most important of them. Um, two two main things that I I want to tell you about. One is that there are many theologians that said true gratitude. The, the attitude of gratitude itself, um, it, it as a moral, we could say moral as a as a as a as a moral outlook. Um, it, it is not truly possible without the the initial step of developing patience because the impatient cannot un truly grasp or understand Allah's blessings. Um, so that is w one thing that is often dis said. The more Sufi-esque traditions see um, Shakur as a higher state in spiritual elevation than Sabur. And what they typically say is a person who is Sabur is a person who perseveres with hardship. So you might not like what Allah wills for you but you persevere in patience and you say you know yeah i don't like it but allah i'm patient and uh, i don't object and they see this as a lower grade in spirituality the higher grade in spirituality is to be a shakur where in fact you are actually grateful for hardship, not just patient with hardship. So, as they uh, often would put it, يَرَى الْمِنَنْ فِي طَيِّ الْمِحَنْ يَرَى الْمِنَنْ فِي طَيِّ الْمِحَنْ meaning that when you are afflicted with hardship, you see these afflictions as a blessing. And so you're grateful for, as long as it's willed for by God, you're happy about it. Um, this is, these are the two discussion, the, the two types of discussions. You know, the first, which is usually not by Sufis, more traditional theologians that say, in order to be truly grateful, you learn, you need to learn to be patient first. And the more Sufi-esque tradition that says, um, you know, it's talking, it's the reason it says Sabur and Shakur is that sh Shakur is a higher spiritual level than Sabur and because Shakur is person who is grateful for 
who is not merely patient with hardship, but is actually grateful for hardship. Um, Okay, so then we get to Ayah 6, is قَالَ مُوسَى لِقَوْمِهِ اِذْكُرُوا نِعْمَةَ اللَّهِ عَلَيْكُمْ إِذْ أَنْجَاكُمْ مِنْ آلِ فِرْعَوْنِ يَسُومُونَكُمْ سُوءَ الْعَذَابِ وَيُسَبِّحُونَ أَبْنَاءَكُمْ وَيَسْتَحْيُونَ نِسَاءَكُمْ وَفِي ذَلِكُمْ بَلَاءٌ مِنْ رَبِّكُمْ عَظِيمٌ So, in Ayah 5, what Musa reminds, Ali Salam reminds the, his people of explicitly about the zulumat that they existed. What are these zulumat? What are these darkness? What is this darkness that they exist in? Well, when you look at it, and Jakum min Ali Fir'aun, he saved you from the people of the Pharaoh. He saved you from what? Saved you from oppression. Yasumunakum su al azab. They tortured you, oppressed you. Now, we said Surah Ibrahim is revealed at the end of the Meccan period and is revealed right before the Hijra or actually after the Hijra started. And it is part and parcel of, uh, you want to call it an ideological discourse about what justifies and legitimates the Hijra project is an escape from oppression. The people of Musa escaped from oppression. And that escape from oppression was an escape from darkness to light. And I'll, I'll elaborate more on, I mean, there's more to come, so just hold on and, and bear with me. But who else is also oppressed and suffering azab? It's Muslims. And the project that they're about to embark on is to migrate, to escape that oppression. And we know that in several of the Meccan Sur, Allah tells Muslims that Allah is that part of the divine project is the amunna ala ladina stadu'ifu that to to empower those who have been disempowered. The zulumat, the darkness, as much as so many Muslims have tried to resist that conclusion. In my opinion, it is obvious. The darkness that you are coming out of, and the reason that it's described as darkness in the plural, not in the singular, not the darkness of kuf for simply kuf as a single darkness, but that oppression takes many different forms, all of it darkness. And oppression is darkness. Wherever it exists, and in whatever form it exists, when human beings are Consistently, we know that Allah by now has revealed enough of the Qur'an for us to know 
that Allah absolutely does not like injustice. So how about a society in which injustice is habitually and regularly done? How can it not be darkness? I mean, we human beings often try to for many psychological reasons, they, they try to water down messages that makes them uncomfortable. But if you just sit and, and ask yourself, how would Allah describe a society plagued by injustices? Well, in Surah Ibrahim, you get a very white in your face answer that it is a society of darknesses, in the plural. A society plagued by darkness. When you are not in a place where you can live ethically because the people of this place are addicted to the pleasures of life, materialism, addicted to persecuting reformers and those who speak the truth or those who try to achieve goodness. And they don't like those who are straightforward and clean. In other words, we're talking about ayah number two and three, right? So if you are in a society that has all the symptoms of having gone astray, oppression is a very natural condition to occur in a society like that. It doesn't like reformers, it doesn't like people who are ethical, and you are, it, it's, it, it, it is, um, inflicted or, or it is uh, 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 infected by materialism and a, a, an addiction to what we today call consumerism. And in that society, when people are oppressed, the expression of lulumat is very fitting. Like the people of Musa, and as we will see, like the people of Ibrahim, and as we will see, the sharp contrast to that, that Surah Ibrahim sets for us. And then, and subhanAllah, that's all it wants to tell us about the legacy of Musa in Surah Ibrahim. All it wants to tell us is that the, 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 is the paradigm of oppression and leaving oppression. You, you have to pay attention to these things. When the Quran tells us the details of the story, there is a reason for it. When the Quran just flags a, a, a headline of a story, there is a reason for it. And the headline that it flagged here about the story of Musa salam is oppression and darkness. And then it moved on. <laughs> so... So this is seven. I'm at seven now. Um, 
And you, when your Lord proclaimed, if you give thanks, I will surely grant you increase, but if you are ungrateful, truly my punishment is severe. Yeah, I, ta is, uh, I don't know. Ta'azana is proclaimed, but it is, it connotes like a, um, a surety. It's like when I give you some assurance of a thing, or that's a ta'azun. Um, And then Musa says uh, to his people, that just remember that if you and everyone on earth do not believe Allah is Ghaniyun Hamid, Allah is of no need. So in other words, the, the constant reminder that this is all for you and your own benefit. And then it moves on to a brief mention of Nuh, Ad, wa Thamud. ألم يأتكم نبأ الذين من قبلكم قوم نوح نوح وعاد وثمود والذين ما والذين من بعدهم لا يعلمهم إلا الله جاءتهم رسلهم بالبينات فردوا فردوا أيديهم في أفواههم وقالوا إن كفرنا بما أرسلتم به وإن لا في شك مما تدعوننا إليه مريب that brief mention of the people of Nuh and Ad and Thamud. This is ayah number nine, where it says, "وَالَّذِينَ مِنْ بَعْدِهِمْ لَا يَعْلَمُهُمْ إِلَّا اللَّهِ." And the generations after them, that only Allah knows. That's the part that has the narrative or the narration from Imam Ali about Kathib al-Ansab and which got tied into the point about the Arabic language. Uh, that there are, that the way human beings imagine um, uh, lineage uh, is not an objective thing but it is an actually an ideological project and that uh, only Allah knows the real you know the, the truth of lineage that that's a whole debate that was um, of course you know um, it's interesting that when when in modern age, when we do DNA analysis, we discover that, in fact, especially in places like the Middle East, people are ethnically hopelessly mixed. Um, you know, the, the idea of it, 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 especially in, in places where there has been a lot of uh, migration and a lot of movement and a long history. Um, so anyway. Um, that expression, let's see how it's the book, this a nine, uh, no, 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 about them, they thrust, but they thrust their hands into their mouths and said, Verily we disbelieve in that wherewith you have been sent, and we are in grave doubt about that to which you call us. It's an idiomatic expression um, that means or an idiomatic expression to describe when people um, when people want to reject something 
in an absolute and unequivocal way at the 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 they put their hands to their mouth but it, it's not literal it's idiomatic the, uh, it's an old arabic expression not used in in modern arabic but basically that means uh you know i don't want to talk to you i don't want to hear from you uh this is something i'm not open to at all um In a lot of the tafsir tradition, they you find some interesting things written about. I mean, our ancestors used to to pay very careful attention to the Quran. If you notice in in verse nine, it says, "Inna kafarna bima ursiltum We we don't believe in what you what you brought us, right? Then it says, وَإِنَّ لَفِي شَكٍ مِمَّا تدعوننا, تَدْعُونَنَا إِلَيْهِ مُرِيبٍ And we have grave doubts about what you are inviting us to. So a lot of the commentators would say, well, how could it be that kuf, this belief, is mentioned before doubt? That they they said we don't believe and then they say we have serious doubts about what you're saying it should be the other way around and there are very interesting discussions about this that ha has to do with the psychology of people is their first reaction when when they say that kafarna bima ursiltum be is it is not a rational position. It is a position of rejection based on their biases and self-interests. And, and that's why the expression of putting their, their hands to their mouths. In other words, you say, we don't want to hear it. Just get away from us. We're not open. We don't want to hear it. We don't believe you. And then, when they calm down a bit, their second reaction is to start coming up with reasons why they're rejecting it. So it's first the rejection, then the reasons for the rejection. And the reasons is where you start saying, well, you know, how do you know God exists? Well, how, how is it they're going to be hereafter? Well, you know, they start coming up with the, the, and I've always thought it's interesting that, you know, the people who were um, commenting on the Quran w would catch things like that and say, you know, it's, if, this, if these people were not so dogmatic, their doubt would have preceded their kuf instead of their kuf preceding their doubt. Um, rather interesting, right? So, can you notice that when they start discussing their doubts, the matter boils down to what the Quran keeps time and time and time telling us is a persistent problem in disbelief. And that is, you want us to believe in something other than what our inherited social habits and structures have anchored in our life. So it is as if consistently Allah is saying that the bonds and the barriers, and I'll, I'll put it bluntly to you, the barriers to breaking the shackles of oppression in the same way that the barriers 
for the early Muslims to, to join the Prophet Muhammad and to eventually immigrate with the Prophet Muhammad and eventually to even fight with the Prophet Muhammad what are the barriers? The barriers are the deeply ingrained social habits and deeply nestled comfort zones. We human beings like to live in predictability. We like to live in the comfort of knowing what was, what is, and what will come. But the problem is when these comforts legitimate structure of Zulumat and legitimate structures of injustice to get us to take a stand against deeply ingrained injustices and systems of oppression is always hard. And and where they say Fatuna Bisultan in Mubin, this is in ten. Most traditional tafsir and Sufi as tafsir for that matter, they they'll tell you that Sultan Mubin means so you know we will not gonna we're not gonna follow you unless you bring us decisive proof. Well, of course, the decisive proof is very subjective. It, what's the decisive proof? I mean, it, even when there there are miracles like you know Musa not burning in a fire. Uh, sorry, Ibrahim not burning in a fire, or Musa splitting the, the ocean, and so on. Human beings can always say, well, it might have been a trick, it's imagination, um, I didn't see it myself, you know, it's my, whatever. Um, but among the and I, be, I believe it was in in Futuhat al makkiyya by Ibn Arabi, where he says that Sultan Mubin is like it's it's not just saying that bring us decisive proof. It is saying bring us a compulsive act of force that would be equal to the compulsion of our habits and customs. So, it's like saying, we are willing to follow you, but only if you are the most powerful around. It's a very interesting, interesting perspective. That for Ibn Arabi, he, he sort of cut to the chase and he said you know it's like saying if you are able to give us a competing way of life that would preserve our privileges and our habits or that would pay us as much money would make us feel as secure and it's interesting because a lot of times it's not that people are, is that, it's, it's remarkable, it's like, people will sometimes change their life, but only if it goes from exchanging one evil master to, with another evil master. Then they're willing to change. But they're not willing to change if it means getting rid of an evil master to the indeterminacy of morality. So, Ayah 11, um, uh, 
the, the meaning is obvious that then they're, they're, they're prophets. And notice here, قَالَتْ لَهُمْ رُسُولُهُمْ So, because Allah is talking about a sort of summing up the experiences of a number of prophets, or nearly all the prophets, because it's all the same, um, is that their prophets respond to them that we are just humans, just like you, and we have no sultan, we have no power, um, except what God gives us. Beyond that, and so in the, we have nothing but persuasion. And, and that is the challenge, is that we're just simply offering you something that either convinces you or not convinces you. Okay. وما لنا ألا نتوكل على الله وقد هدانا سبلنا سبلنا ونصبرنا على ما أذيتمونا وعلى الله فليتوكل المتوكلون. This is twelve. Um, and, sh- and why should we not trust in God? And when God has guided us in our ways, and we shall in- surely endure patiently, however you may torment us. And let those who trust, trust in God. The only thing I, I note about um, 12 is um, this expression, ala ma azaytumuna, that time and time again, the Quran sets the expectation for those who perform that role of calling people to their conscience, of resisting the darkness, resisting the oppression, is that they will suffer as a harm, hurt, hardship. Thirteen, and the response then is again, it's like an... um, um, generalized response. The Quran is not telling us this is the response of any specific people, but it is a response like a paradigm response. It is a what you should expect as a natural dynamic to take place. The response is to the those people, to, to the prophets and their followers, to the reformers, to the people who are try to resist the darkness, um, we will either you stop saying what you're saying or we will expel you from our lands. Now, expulsion, um, it could also be we will extinguish you from our from the land. So in other words, we'll kill you. Um, okay. We are now. We we are at verse thirteen. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. And so we left off where the <coughs> um, the general response of persecuting the prophets and their followers, or persecuting the reformers, or persecuting those who resist zulumat as we said, oppression. And the response in Surah Ibrahim underlines or underscores the idea of zulumat as oppression. So, وَلُنْسْكِنَنَّكُمُ الْأَرْضَ مِنْ بَعْدِهِمْ This is uh, verse 14. ذَلِكَ لِمَنْ خَافَ مَقَامِي وَخَافَ وَعِيدٍ وَلِنُسْكِنَنَّكُمُ الْأَرْضَ مِنْ بَعْدِهِمْ 
um, literally, you inhabit the earth after them. But of course, the the literal translation does not convey the meaning. In the study Quran, it says, and we shall surely make you to dwell in the land after them. Yeah, dwell in the land after them, inhabit the earth after them. But what you is idiomatic. It's a matter of um, uh, the, which means you will be in charge after them. So, in part, this is talking to the Prophet ﷺ, Muhammad and, and his followers and predicting their victory. And, but in part, it is stating something that we will see is at the heart and core of Surah Ibrahim. the eventual supremacy of goodness or that goodness will eventually prevail but we'll come back to, to this now this this expression was is very uh, fascinating this is verse 15 um, and they sought victory, and every stubborn tyrant fails. What Staftahu is Stansaru Billah, or um, that they They directed all their hopes for victory, but not just victory, but they directed all their hopes for a resolution towards their Lord. Now, so it's obviously, obviously you're talking about those who fight the darkness. And, and then it says, and, and, and every tyrant will fail. This, just make a mental note of this, because we see Surah Ibrahim comes with a larger point about the, the ethical laws of the cosmos. And so it, it would be erroneous for a Muslim activist or reformer or whatever to expect that victory will necessarily be achieved in their lifetime or in any amount of lifetimes. But as long as people uphold the principle of the light and resist oppression, the, the laws that Allah has anchored in this universe is that morality, goodness, will continue to survive and in fact prevail. Um, Okay. So now Surah Ibrahim segues in a, a sort of a, a short um, passages that address that in this is in Ayah uh, 16 and 17 that address the punishment that is reserved for these tyrants. 
but as we will see in Surah Ibrahim, that it is not just the tyrants who will end up in a, in a world of trouble, but it's also those who followed the tyrants, who obeyed the tyrants. So after it tells us that Khaba Kulla Jabbarin Ani, that after tells us that tyrants are stubborn, as we saw in, in the example of the Pharaoh and the example of every tyrant like Namrud and so many others in the, the their prototype is intoxicated with their power. It is very difficult for a tyrant, if not impossible, for a tyrant to simply voluntarily uh, reform. Once you get to that level of intoxication with power, um, you're, you're, so, you're so in deep with the demonic. I personally think that tyrants, it's as if they're possessed. I mean, it's not that it doesn't give them off the hook in terms of their accountability, but it is amazing how, how much evil they're capable of committing. Um, and not, you know, not, not, not a second thought. They kill people, they torture people, they end lives, they terminate, you know, entire families, entire, and, and, it, it, and that's demonic. I mean, they become like, they, they become literally human demons. And when you become a human demon, you know, but, and that is why a tyrant needs to be overcome forcibly. I mean, it is, you, you, you're, how many times in human history have you read about a tyrant who, you know, just has a conscientious rebirth, who wakes up and says, oh yeah, you know, killing so many people and torturing so many people is wrong. And so the, the way that these, the, the fate of these tyrants, it gives you a, a powerful image, in my view, just in case these tyrants are going to listen, although we all know that they're not going to listen, that they are going to be there experiencing constant thirst and what they're given to drink is something that can, that is extremely it's a, the the picture of the fate of their deeds in putting people in a constant predicament because if you think of what tyrants do when they oppress people they put you in a predicament where you, you, there's no escape from you, you you and there is no relief from torment you can't sleep, you can't eat, you can't love, you can't live, you can't... The, when tyrants persecute people, and so when you reflect upon 15 and 16, it will dawn on you, whoa, the emotional predicament that these tyrants are going to be put in is precisely what they put other people through, throughout their lives. And then in 18, it comes, and this is all as, as typical of Quranic style, it's now going to start revving up to the main point of Surah Ibrahim. So in 18, مثل الذين كفروا بربهم أعمالهم كرماد اشتدت به الريح في يوم عاصف لا يقدرون مما كسبوا على شيء ذلك هو الضلال البعيد It comes and it tells you Allah knows that as human beings you think that without Allah you construct things you construct that you might even be tempted to think that you've constructed goodness or that you've constructed something healthy. But Allah keeps reminding human beings 
that without God, what you've constructed is but a mirage. And when, notice here, when it says, Ishtaddat bihiri, when the wind, when, the, when it storms, when the wind blows hard, you discover that what you've constructed is a mirage. Now, in my view, when it says when the wind blows, of course, in traditional tefasir, they say, uh, well, in the final day, then you discover that all these deeds are not worth it. But, but no, no. It's not just in the final day. Morality and ethics not anchored on a bedrock of God is immorality and ethics without foundation. And so when the when you reach a point of crisis, it is very easy for people to relinquish this morality and ethics. So some of the worst atrocities humanity has experienced has been committed by communist regimes, godless regimes. Till today, by the way, a full accounting of the atrocities committed by communist regimes doesn't exist. You know, how, how many people have the, the, the Chinese regime actually murdered. We don't really don't know till now. How many the, the Soviet Union, how many Muslims has the Soviet Union killed in the former in the in the Muslim republics? No one has kept count. And because Muslims were counting, no one knows. So that's one. But more important than that or the emergence of Nazism, for instance, and the and Nazism grew out of a, a philosophical debate that basically said, well, since everything is relative, and since there is no morality other than what these liberal democracies define for themselves, then why not the morality of racial supremacy? And it was entirely illogical. But beyond that, um, we cannot be oblivious to the amount of genocidal violence that liberal democracies themselves committed. When they basically, when it, it's one thing to, to, to talk about citizenry within, within your borders, and within a, racial, a racially homogeneous population. But when it when these liberal democracies dealt with the other outside their borders and with those that they saw as their best interests, their national interests, uh, you know, meant that they needed to dominate the society or that society, they were capable, they committed shocking amount of violence and immorality. Look at what the Dutch did in Africa, or what the, the French did in Africa. I mean, and, 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 and which both the Dutch and the French have never taken responsibility for what they've done. Or what the United States has done with American Indians, or what Israel has done with Palestinians. Or So, I mean, the the and the paradigm in philosophy that we always struggle with 
is that, you know, the, the typical um, uh, thing, if you're on a boat and the boat, it, it, people on the boat start thinking that, well, if we don't lighten the load, we're going to, we might drown. Is it ethical to throw, to, to pick one and throw them, you know, throw them in the sea, kill them? Uh, to and godless morality has the hardest time saying no because every way you approach it philosophically the conclusion is well if you can sacrifice someone even if you're not 100% sure that it's necessary to save sacrifice one to save nine even if it's 90% sure 80% sure, and then you start getting into these philosophical debates. How about if you're 70% sure that if you kill someone, then you save nine? Well, how about if you're 60% sure? Well, how about if you're 51% sure? At what point do you come and say, no, it's, you, you can't sacrifice someone to save the nine? Because it's ultimately morality that is based on functionalism. And so you always, you know, engaging in these equations, in these games of, well, is it more likely? Is it more certain? You know, do, do we, how sure are you? What would the reasonable person do? And then we start getting to discussions of what, what is reasonability? What is a reasonable person? Is a reasonable person a racialized person? Is a person a reasonable person a gendered person? You know, endless philosophical debates that just endless endless you go on for ever and you know you read hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of books and where you start is where you end god comes and resolves some resolves many of these baseline moral debates it's wrong because it's wrong same thing, we confronted that same debate with torture. I think Allah has made it very clear, torture is haram. No if, ands, or buts. It's never allowed. Although some, in my view, idiot Muslims would disagree. But they're idiots on everything and everywhere. But when, again, when it came to the quote-unquote war on terror and it came to dealing with the racialized other, suddenly countries that have been saying torture is wrong since World War II and have played key roles in drafting international conventions prohibiting torture in all circumstances, no if ands, or buts, suddenly these same countries the United States, Britain, Israel, and so on. Well, Israel uh, was never totally against torture, but they, they, they went back and forth. Anyway, uh, we're saying, uh, well, you know, maybe it's okay. Well, you know, if, it's, if you're pretty sure you're going to prevent a terrorist attack, then it's okay. Well, what, if you're in, what does pretty sure mean? 90% sure? 70% sure? 60% sure? And pretty soon we were torturing people simply if it was, if we were more likely than not that we were going to get some information to prevent a terrorist attack. And then we were torturing people when we weren't sure why we're torturing people. That's the nature, in my view, of a godless morality. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, the way I understand this is that when it is tested, when it is tested, means when the means when the storm blows. The storm is tested. When your morality is really tested, you discover that it is nothing. That you've built a sand castle. And notice, then it says, 
huwa dalalul ba'id this is 18 of course right so the parable of those who disbelieve in their, in their Lord, their deeds are as ashes that the wind blows hard on a stormy day. They have no power over, uh, over aught they have earned. That is ex the extreme error. This is how it, what it means to be truly lost. So, If you put it together, you start seeing how Surah Ibrahim is constructing to you, for you, the image of a zulumat. To exist in light means to exist illuminated. To exist in light means to exist in illumination, which means to exist knowing the difference between right and wrong. You are sure that certain things are right and certain things are wrong. To oppress people is wrong. To persecute people is wrong. To use and people to your advantage to exploit their weaknesses is wrong. That type of moral certitude is light. Darkness is when nothing is for sure. Everything can be, well, it just depends, you know. So it says, This is what it means to be truly lost. So then it reminds you of something that you need to be reminded of. Remember that if, if you are not immoral people, it is very, it is without any difficulty, Allah can replace you. That Allah can completely take you out and replace you with another. Again, sort of counter the chosen people thesis. Don't think you're chosen. Don't think that you can be as unjust and, and as dark as you want and somehow know you, ha you're, you have a privileged position. It doesn't work that way. God doesn't play favorites. God cares about the values. Okay. وبرزوا لله جميعا فقال الضعفاء للذين استكبروا إن كنا لكم تبعا فهل أنتم مغنون عنا من عذاب الله من شيء قالوا لو هدانا الله لهديناكم سواء علينا أجزعنا أم صبرنا ما لنا من محيص So then it takes you back again to one of the core things in this is uh, 21 one of the core things in the whole paradigm of oppression and darkness is a tyrant is not possible without those who obey the tyrant. Oppression is not possible without an army of people facilitating the oppression and allowing it to exist. And in the final day, those who have obeyed these commands will look to those who justified this oppression, philosophized the oppression, they, those who issued the superior orders, and say, well, it's your fault. And of course, the response to that, well, you didn't have, you, you know, it, you obeyed us because you're corrupt. And we, we encountered this repeatedly in the Quran, time and time again, is that it's like alerting you 
if you say now, well, you know, I'm doing it because I'm told to do it. Well, just if you're saying this now, then just remember in the hereafter, when you try to blame, to lay the blame on the person who's giving you the orders, it's not going to work. Yes, that person is in trouble, but you are also in trouble. And the response of the privileged and the empowered is typically arrogant. They effectively, the response, blames God. Because it says, Oh, well, you know, if Allah would have guided us, if Allah would have made us good, we would have, we would have ordered you to be good. So their, their arrogant attitude persists. It's like, you, you would have followed us t towards goodness. And this goes back to this issue where I flagged earlier of that Allah does not will unless you will. That theme of blaming God for what you've, the, the ways that you've gone astray is a very common tactic. It's a but it doesn't work. Okay. And then, Shaitan, of course, has to figure into the picture because all the law, all darkness is demonic. And all the demonic has Shaitan in its core. And basically what Shaitan says is exactly what the powerful are going to tell the disempowered or the, the, those who issue the superior orders are going to tell to those who obey them. Don't blame me. Blame yourself. I just simply... I just simply invited you to do wrong and you were more than willing to do it. You got a lot out of it. So don't pretend now that you are innocent victims in this process. So now, Surah Ibrahim of course, whenever Allah mentions hellfire, Allah has to mention heaven. And so you have a brief mention of salvation, but it's in, in a single ayah, 23. But then Surah Ibrahim moves to one of the core central themes that brings us back to this notion of the struggle between darkness and light. أَنَمْ تَرَى كَيْفَ ضَرَبَ اللَّهُ مَثَلًا كَلِمَةً طَيِّبَةً كَشَجَرَةٍ طَيِّبَةً أَصْلُهَا ثَابِتٌ وَفَرْعُهَا فِي السَّمَاءِ تُؤْتِي أُكُلَهَا كُلَّ حِينٍ بِإِذْنِ رَبِّهَا وَيَضْرِبُ اللَّهُ الْأَمْثَالَ لِلنَّاسِ لَعَلَّهُمْ يَتَذَكَّرُونَ This is 25. ومثل كلمة خبيثة كشجرة خبيثة اشتثت من فوق الأرض ما لها من قرار يثبت الله الذين آمنوا بالقول الثابت في الحياة الدنيا وفي الآخرة ويضل الله الظالمين ويفعل الله ما يشاء So the Lord says الكلمة الطيبة the study Quran translates it as uh, a good word. A good word is a good tree. Uh, a kalima tayyiba in in traditional tafsir, you know, you get these interesting debates about whether the kalima tayyiba, the good word, is la ilaha illallah, or is it ashadu anna la ilaha illallah, or is it Allah, or... I, I think that these are all miss the mark. A kalima tayyiba 
it is not if a, a word or a phrase. A kalima tayyiba is the concept itself. It is the concept of goodness. And this, by the way, is a, a um, I mean, it's a, it's a, a bit surprising because it, the, that expression, a kalima tayyiba, to refer to a the concept of goodness itself or the concept of being of justice or concept of ethics or concept of beauty is um, idiomatic. It's, it's, not, it's not unprecedented in, in the Quranic usage. But what is important here is that that, that parable, that goodness is like a rooted, deeply rooted tree. It sprouts fruits regularly, repeatedly, every now and then. But it is anchored. It is, it is a rooted tree. It is stable, but trees take a long time to grow and fruit takes a while to grow and trees need to be watered so they need the effort the deliberation but if that that the if goodness takes root then you have something that is stable and that will produce goodness repeatedly throughout a very long time while immorality, darkness, despotism, injustice is like a foul tree but this foul tree is even strange because it's a tree we, that is uprooted it is a marvel because can you imagine it, it, it a tree that is uprooted um, while it does whatever it does, whatever effect it does at the moment of its existence, but it has no life. It is, it is against the sunnah of Allah in creation. And is Allah's and Allah constantly reminds you that if you want to know what Allah supports, Allah supports those who believe in this, believe in Allah's parable, believe in the light, believe in goodness. That but Allah support is by the resolute word. Zeldi translate the Qawla Thabit. Um, they translate, the study of Quran says, God makes firm those who believe with the firm speech in the life of this world. With the resolute word, with the unwavering word about justice, about goodness, about light. In other words, Allah knows that we as human beings, we're going to doubt. We're going to say, oh, does right and wrong really exist? Does justice really exist? Isn't, uh, isn't everything relative? Isn't everything basically vanilla and constantly, you know, what's right for you is wrong for someone else and what's good for you is bad for someone else and it's all. And that's not a call of Sabbath. Qawla Sabbath is to believe in the 
in when Allah says no these absolutes do exist that resolve is a gift from God 28 the only thing I want to say is that notice وَأَحَلُّ قَوْمَهُمْ دَارَ الْبَوَارِ um, the Sunni Quran says and caused their people to dwell in the abode of perdition um, it's it's like um, um, those who have turned away from the blessings that we have been talking about, have turned away from a qawl al-thabit fil hayat al-dunya wal-akhirah. And when doing so, when when you when you've turned away from even the possibility of the light, and from the very idea of a qawl al-thabit of the resolute word, what you've done is you've brought ruin to your to your people because. You've relinquished the entire paradigm of morality and ethics and right and wrong, and that's precisely a halu dar qawmahum dar al bawar. You've bought what you've taken your people down a path of ruin. Okay. وَجَعَلُوا لِلَّهِ أَنْدَادًا لِيُضِلُّوا عَنْ سَبِيلِهِ قُلْ تَمَتَّعُوا فَإِنَّ مَصِيرَكُمُ النَّارِ So, we've encountered the Quranic usage of Andad before. And if you remember, this is 30, um, Uh, the, the study Quran translates it as set up equals unto God. Uh, if you remember, we said, and dead are um, it, they're effective equals. Meaning that they are not necessarily وَجَعَلُوا لِلَّهِ أَنْدَادًا that not necessarily people things that you explicitly or officially or in an outspoken fashion say are equal to God. But th- things that you effectively defer to as if they have equal merit and authority to God. So although and it doesn't it only makes sense if you if you are someone who claims to believe in God. So although you believe in God but your and dad could be anything that you take your values from and that you consider to be authoritative on the same issues that we have been talking about. So, you know, if it it could be a job, it could be a family, it could be um, a man, a woman, it could be... it could be wealth, it could be a country, it could be whatever. Whatever you ultimately um, defer to when it comes to the issues that ought to be the realm of the divine and only the divine. Especially these issues where in, in, when it comes to believing in values, 
in believing in something like justice or be, or opposing darkness or embracing the light and so on and so forth. And again the Quran reminds us that it's as if it's it's constantly reminding us that that the that the the sort of secret formula against taking being among those that even unintentionally create and dead for Allah uh, cre- effective equals to Allah is salah and alongside salah time and time again you notice spending in secret and in sirran wa'alaniya, in secret and in public. And we've talked about this before. Why spending? Because uh, th- that is often the nid to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Money. The biggest um effective de facto partner to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is money that is the thing that people have the hardest time with uh, you know people could be willing to be moral at so many levels but not when it comes to their money that's where they have the hardest time parting with And then Allah reminds us and we we now are become familiar enough that with patterns in the Quran that Allah will remind us repeatedly of how much of our life in fact depends on Allah. So this is 32, 33, and 34. That Allah is constantly giving you an endless stream of blessings. And in fact, if you ever try to count Allah's blessings upon you, you're not going to be able to count it. But if you had a full consciousness of the amount of blessings you would enjoy, that issue of of andad lillah, that of effective partners to Allah, wouldn't even come up. Because you would be so weighed down by gratitude for every minute, for, you know, every time you take a breath, every time you swallow something and it doesn't cause you agonizing pain, every time you move and it doesn't cause cause you agonizing pain, every time you sit, it doesn't cause you pain, every time you sleep and it doesn't, you're not in pain, every time you wake up and you're not in pain, every time you go to the bathroom and you're not in pain, every time, can you, I mean, all the things that could go wrong where you, in fact, are not in this blessing, where you experience pain with all of these things, then you would be really conscious. But that's the nature of human beings. We, we just go on. We, we enjoy things and take them for granted. But if you wanted to protect yourself against that tendency to create effective equals to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and these undead to kun abdan shakur that you would become a grateful human being but Allah recognizes in the Seneca of the Kafar that human beings are in fact have the hardest time with being with gratitude 
ओके देन एट दिस पॉइंट इट्स लाइक आफ्टर गेटिंग यू इन दैट फ्रेम ऑफ माइंड ऑफ अंडरस्टैंडिंग दिस इन दिस सो इट्स वी स्टार्टेड आउट विद इब्राहिम we went to musa briefly very briefly to a brief mention of a number of past nations ad samud and um who was ad samud and people of nuh yeah qaum nuh and then from that taking you to some of the basic cosmic issues about darkness and light morality and immorality ethics and lack of ethics and underscoring the extent to which allah is already in your life but the extent to which we also ignore that allah is already in our lives and the extent to which in order to be anchored in goodness we need allah and <clears throat> to remind us that although darkness exists but darkness <clears throat> is like the foul rootless tree it doesn't have a loss support what we must believe is allah is always on the side of the light allah allah is always on the side of goodness then after taking us through this journey it comes back to ibrahim when you see the quran do that the quran is alerting you to the main point of the surah when you see the quran mention a prophet take you through then you have to pay very careful attention to the ride it takes you through it's not taking you to entertain you it has a point and you have to read it very carefully to understand this point and then it comes back to this prophet is getting ready to tell you okay here's the point from the surah wa is qala ibrahim rabb ij'al hadha al-balada amina wajnubni wa baniya an na'bud al-asnam rabb innahunna adlanna kathiran min an-nas faman tabi'ani fa innahu minni wa man 'asani fa innaka ghafurur rahim ربنا اني اسكنت من ذريتي بواد غير ذي زرع عند بيتك المحرم ربنا ليقيموا الصلاه فاجعل افئده من الناس تهوى اليهم وارزقهم من الثمرات لعلهم يشكرون ربنا انك تعلم ما ما نخفي وما نعلن وما يخفى على الله من شيء في الارض ولا في السماء الحمد لله الذي الذي وهب لي على الكبر على الكبر اسماعيل واسحاق ان ربي لسميع الدعاء رب اجعلني مقيم الصلاه ومن ذريتي ربنا وتقبل دعاء ربنا اغفر لي ولوالدي وللمؤمنين يوم يقوم الحساب ولا تحسبن الله غافلا عما يعمل الظالمين انما يؤخرهم ليوم تشخص فيه الابصار ابراهيم عليه الصلاه والسلام comes back to this point and surah ibrahim which is why it was called surah ibrahim then has that supplication that starts out with allah make this balad this balad refers to mecca first amina Mm. 
the study Quran make this land secure. Okay. All right. So now this has always sort of given me you know, I, I just it sort of blew my mind, it always blows my mind, or you know is that the Muslims again they they are persecuted and getting ready to leave this land. So you know if you're talking about normal human dynamics you're you're not in any mood to praise the land that's persecuting the heck out of you and you're getting ready to leave it. But because this is a divine message, it doesn't respond to normal human things, right? So what is it gonna say about this land that they're that they have endured their most horrible days in and they're gonna getting ready to leave and they don't know if they're ever gonna see it again. I mean, that is just, they don't know, and I think that it is fair to say that for most Muslims at this point, the idea that they're actually going to conquer this Mecca someday is ridiculous. No one would imagine it. It comes and says that Ibrahim's prayer for this land is first, Rabbi ij'al hadha al-balada amina. Make it safe and secure. Remember, Ibrahim starts out with take people from darkness to light. Musa alayhi salam take the start, it says from darkness to light. What is the problem with the land that of that the Israelites are in. It's a land of darkness because it's a land of oppression. Is it a land of Amn? No. Because Amn means security and tranquility and peace. If you are in the land of oppression, you cannot be in the land of Amn. So, Muslims, as far as they're concerned, their experience in Mecca is not an Amina. <clears throat> They've been persecuted. But Ibrahim's prayer, Ibrahim, whose charge, whose job is to take people from darkness to light, the prayer is, Allah make this land tranquil and safe. And M in this sense is light. To live in an area safe from persecution, not scared that you and your family are going to be persecuted, not scared of injustice, not scared of being targeted, not scared of being, you know, having your property stolen or your loved ones hurt or you yourself, you know, being jailed or beaten or whatever. To live without that fear is M and that is light. And Ibrahim's sincere pray prayer for this land was that it would be a land of M. M the first. And then Ibrahim says, and Allah, for my progeny, please have them not worship. Al -Aslam. Now, we know that, in fact, that prayer was not answered. Because here is Ibrahim's progeny in Mecca, the progeny of his son Ismail, and they're worshipping the Asnaam. 
Worshipping the Asnam means what? That they have now, have adopted and dead to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what is the problem with worshipping Asnam? Well, part is the nid part, is the undead part, right? But part of it, which the Quran repeatedly points out to, is that it is extremely irrational. It is an irrational practice. So, when those methods are described as jahili, as ignorant, it is because of the irrationality of what they did. Because some, you know, idiot Muslims these days follow in the footsteps of Orientalists and say, oh, well, you know, Islam came and it, it undid a rich culture. What rich culture? A, a culture which worshipped idols. A height of irrationality. Ignorance. Darkness. So no, things are not all relative. Not everything is cool and hip and happening. Not everything is nice. If you're going to worship idols, that's stupid. And we're going to call it stupid. And we're going to say it's irrational. We're not going to say, oh, it's cultural diversity and it's really cool. Like a lot of idiotic, Muslim scholars, academics. I'm talking to my fellow academics who are idiots. <laughs> you know, publish these articles. Of course, they're accepted in, in fancy journals and so on. And say, oh, yeah, you know, they, the Arabs, the Muslim Arabs had rich cultures. Look, they worshipped idols and it was so cool. And it's, <laughs> what? It, it, it's the whole paradigm of darkness. It, you know, What do you say? It is the high worship, the the, I, the practice itself was exploitative. It victimized the powerless. It was great if you came from the right tribe, but if you didn't come from the right tribe, you're lost. The fact that you wrote nice poetry doesn't make up for the injustices and the idiocy and the ignorance. I don't know. You know, a lot of the Muslims that go into academia, they are living proof of how culture, in this case, scholarly culture, can twist your thinking where you even lose the most basic rational abilities. Because it is, so, it is so, I mean, you don't need a genius to come and tell you what, are you, what culture are you praising? What culture are you saying the Quran destroyed? With all the, the buried little girls alive, and you're saying that's a rich culture and so it's a real loss that Islam destroyed it? I mean, at every level. But, you know, it's cool to trash Islam. And so, of course, you're going to get tenure and you're going to get awards and you get, get praise because you're trashing Islam. As long as you trash Islam, everyone is going to praise you. And that's the way it works. And that's why, precisely, you need the Qawl al-Thabit. That's why you need the Qur'an. Allah shows you all the time that if you drift without the Qur'an, you're going to become like these idiot Muslim scholars, saying stupid things and being praised, and you're going to feel cool about yourself. Okay. I calm down. And subhanAllah, Ibrahim, who is Halim, the nature of Ibrahim is that he is a benevolent human being. Look at the, فَمَنْ تَبِعَنِي فَإِنَّهُ مِنِّي Those who will follow me in, in my philosophy, in my way of life, they're of me. But those who don't, Ibrahim says, إِنَّكَ غَفُورُ رَحِيمٌ May you forgive them. 
It doesn't mean that Allah will necessarily forgive them, but the attitude of Ibrahim was then Rabbana inni askantu min dhirriyati biwadin ghayri dhidhara Ibrahim states the obvious Allah look Ismail and my family and my dhurriya my lineage has inhabited this arid land and they have inhabited is this arid land as a spot a secret spot to worship you and Ibrahim famous prayer فَجْعَلْ أَفْئِدَةً مِنَ النَّاسِ تَهْوِي إِلَيْهِمْ وَرْضُقْهُمْ مِنَ الثَّمَرَاتِ لَعَلَّهُمْ يَشْكُرُونَ Make the, the prayer is, is very beautiful because it is make the hearts of people flog to them. So make this area an area that earns the hearts of people. You know what we reveal and what we conceal because you know everything. And then Ibrahim alayhi salam Alhamdulillah alladhi wahab ali ala kibar Ismail wa Ishaq inna rabbi la sami'a dua This is 39 Alhamdulillah, who gave me in my old age, Ismail and Ishaq, alayhum uh, salam because, uh, and my Lord hears all prayers. Rabbi ij'anni muqeem al-salati wa min dhurriyati. Allah, enable me to always be someone, me and my progeny, my lineage, worshippers, muqim salah people who establish prayer, and accept our supplications. Rabbana ighfir li wa li walidayya wa lil mu'minina yawma yaqoom al hasab And forgive me and forgive waliday. Of course, this gave pause to Muslim theologians because the parents of Ibrahim were not Muslim. We know that his father, Azar, insisted on not being Muslim. There are conflicting reports, nothing reliable, about Ibrahim's mother. There are some reports that claim that Ibrahim's mother had converted in secret, um, but none of these reports are reliable because none of them reliably go to the Prophet and go back to the Prophet But his supplication, his prayer for his parents. Now, although Muslim theologians spent a lot of time discussing this, I don't think it's a big deal. Because even if your parents were not believers, you should pray for them. It, whether Allah forgives them or not, that's not your business. That's Allah's business. But your job is to do du'a for them. Um, in part because, in part, not just because for them, but for you. Because it affirms the ethical principle of gratitude inside of you. Gratitude, like all ethical principles, the more you practice it, the more it becomes anchored within. And there are there are people who just never got used to being to practicing gratitude. Ethical principles are like exercising. The more you do it, the stronger they become a part of you. And among them is definitely gratitude. Um okay. وَلَا تَحْسَبَنَّ اللَّهَ غَافِلًا عَمَّا يَعْمَلُ الظَّالِمِينَ الظَّالِمُونَ وَلَا تَحْسَبَنَّ اللَّهَ غَافِلًا عَمَّا يَعْمَلُ الظَّالِمُونَ إِنَّمَا يُؤَخِّرُهُمْ لِيَوْمٍ تَشْخَصُ فِيهِ الْأَبْصَارِ Now, 
notice that Ibrahim's prayer, supplication, which is for the believers and those and, and for his parents, it, it fades into or merges into, instead of maybe fades, merges into then Allah's discourse. It's as if Allah seamlessly takes over. In my view, it is because it is as if Allah is saying it is not the important point is not whether Allah is whether Ibrahim articulated these prayers or not. Don't pay don't spend a lot of attention talking about whether Ibrahim said Allah forgive my parents or the 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 reason I'm telling you about this is that you will learn to perform these prayers. And that is why then Allah says in, just merges in, into it. This is 42. Don't think that Allah ever overlooks what the unjust do. The fact that Allah delays their accountability doesn't mean that Allah is oblivious to their injustice. Taking us back again to the theme of the Zulumat. Because anyone that deals with Zulumat will wonder, well, why is God allowing these, these, this, this injustice to persist? If there was no accountability, that would be a valid question. But Put it this way, just recently, I know a person of a guy in Egypt. This is a kid, comes from a very nice family, a very devout family. Very devout, very well-mannered, very nice family. This family has a boy and a girl. The girl is younger than the boy. The boy was in, in, in engineering, he was studying engineering in college, the girl is still in high school. Lo and behold, for reasons only tyrants know about, well, it's because his father was a member of the, of the Muslim Brotherhood. Security forces come, arrest that kid. They arrest the mother, they arrest the father, they arrest the, the, the sister. After about a year, they release the father, they release the mother, they release the, the sister. They keep that kid that I knew. They torture him until he confesses to a crime that everyone knows he had nothing to do with. I mean, th this is someone who just, you know, is all about studying and and living the straight life. He his biggest sin is that he prayed all the all the prayers in a mosque. And of course, in in a country like Egypt, if you pray in the in the mosque, uh, you're a target to security forces. So anyway. They they torture him. He, he they get him to confess to something he didn't, and the, the kangaroo trial. They try him and they sentence him to death. And just two days ago, the, I saw I I know this kid before he was arrested. He look a very nice looking kid. His picture after he was tortured, you wouldn't recognize him. He looks like he aged. 30 years and he lost his front teeth and he just he looked just like he aged like he's an old man and then two days ago I wake up to the news that he was put to death everyone knows that he is innocent sort and of course the reaction was extreme depression extreme anger but then I had a dream that 
I saw him in the year after, and there was a lot of people that I knew, and we were all looking at him, and we were all so jealous because of what the the status he he went like ahead of all of us we were all waiting in line for accountability and he was like zoop he just went through and and we all knew that you know he was getting all the and then the, i never forget the discussion and the dream and then i woke up we started saying oh i wish it was me i wish it was me i wish it, it was i who was put to death so we get that special treatment accountability If you understand what accountability is, and I and and I woke up after that, I, I stopped being so depressed, because I I understood that Allah, it's a message from Allah. Because Allah is 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 talking to me, that, you know, yeah, I I feel horrible for him, for his parents, for, but, in the final day, you will be the object of envy, for for everyone and that's the nature of accountability to ask why do tyrants last would make sense that type of angry question would make sense if there was no accountability accountability turns everything on its head because in a different context those of us who are never tortured never punished, never put to death, will in fact be, you know, okay, and as if to underscore this, look at the image of the unjust in the hereafter. مُخْتِعِينَ مُقَنِّعِي رُؤُوسِهِمْ لَا يَرْتَدُّ إِلَيْهِمْ طَرَفُهُمْ وَأَفْئِدَتُهُمْ هَوَاء An extremely powerful image. This is 43. For those who in fact created or anchored this tyranny and spread this darkness. Next outstretched and heads upraised, their glance returning not to them, their hearts vacant, meaning that they, they're, 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 they're effectively on their knees and they can't even look ahead of them and that same fear that people li live through when they experience tyranny is going to be nestled in their heart. If you know, if you, you know, when people are persecuted, arrested, and tortured, the thing that you experience is that, that you're literally, you're as if your heart is ripped out of your chest. Well, that's exactly what they're going to be experiencing. وَانْذِرِ النَّاسَ يَوْمَ يَأْتِيهُمُ الْعَذَابُ فَيَقُولُ الَّذِينَ ظَلَمُوا رَبَّنَا أَخِّرْنَا إِلَىٰ أَجَلٍ قَرِيبٍ نُجِبْ دَعْوَتَكَ وَنَتَّبِعُ الرُّسُلُ أَوَلَمْ تَكُونُ أَقْصَمْتُمْ مِنْ قَبْلُ وَمَا لَكُمْ مِنْ زَوَالٍ This is 44 that, of course, when they confront accountability, they say, you know, give us a chance. And the response, we know what the response is, is that, well, you know, there are no further more chances. وَسَكَنْتُمْ فِي مَسَاكِنِ الَّذِينَ ظَلَمُوا أَنفُسَهُمْ وَتَبَيَّنَ لَكُمْ كَيْفَ فَعَلْنَا بِهِمْ وَضَرَبْنَا لَكُمُ الْأَمْثَالِ Okay. So, the first response is, yes, you, you, you know, didn't, didn't you have an opportunity and, in fact, you, you acted, أَقْصَمْتُمْ you effectively, whether expressly or implicitly, you swore that there is no accountability and now you're confronting accountability but the second point in 45 
وسكنتم مساكن الذين ظلموا مساكن الذين ظلموا انفسهم and you settled in the dwellings of those who wronged themselves though it was made clear to you how we dealt with them and we set forth for you the parables what does it mean to say وَسَكَنْتُمْ فِي مَسَاكِنِ الَّذِينَ ظَلَمُوا أَنفُسَهُمْ does it mean that you've actually inhabited the same dwellings answer is no it means that you followed the same way of life of those who have committed these injustices that you've adopted the same habits because tyrants and the darkness that comes from tyrants is all the same it's the same habits of privilege and arrogance and oppression and injustice and persecution okay and that is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَضَرَبْنَا لَكُمُ الْأَمْثَالِ And we've given you the parables, i.e. Surah Ibrahim itself. You've received notice and yet you followed the same lifestyle and did the same thing. وَقَدْ مَكَرُوا مَكْرَهُمْ وَعِنْدَ اللَّهِ مَكْرُهُمْ وَإِنْ كَانَ مَكْرُهُمْ لَتَزُولُ مِنْهُ الْجِبَالِ لَتَزُولَ مِنْهُ الْجِبَالِ فلا تحسبن الله مخلف وعده رسله رسله إن الله عزيز ذو انتقام This um, Uh, the reason I'm, I'm flipping is وَقَدْ مَكَرُوا مَكْرَهُمْ The study Quran, this is 46, says and they devise their plot but their plot lies with God. Uh, again, it is not that they devised a plot that is a very literal translation but it has to be has to be translated according to the old classical usage not more modern Arabic and it would mean like they have constructed or they followed a way, their way of life, or they constructed their concepts, or they constructed their, um, their philosophies of existence. So it is like saying they followed they followed their own philosophy and that philosophy is so destructive that it could destroy mountains and and then the that Again, the affirmation of Allah's promise that don't think, and this is directed to the Prophet Muhammad especially, don't think that Allah breaks his promises. 
especially that Allah is talking to the Prophet Muhammad and embarking on this next stage that is full of insecurities. But then this expression, Yawma Tubaddalu al Ardu Ghayr al Ardi wa Samawatu wa Barazu Lillahi al Wahid al Qahar. There have been, this is 48, there have been so many attempts to explain verse 48. And a lot of the traditional tafsir, you read some really fantastical things about what does the uh, the, um, the day the earth shall be changed into other than the earth. And that's very literal. And, you know, then you, you read in, in the traditional tafsir that the earth will be this and the earth will... And none of it is reliable. You know, some of it is, is really outlandish, like the earth will be a plane of silver and... Um, I don't want to even take time uh, because none of it is reliable. But that remarkable thing is that in my opinion only only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only God would say an expression like the earth will be other than the earth. It's as if Allah is telling us you have no frame of reference for understanding what it will become. You live anchored in this reality, but what it will become in the hereafter is so foreign to you that I, the, the language doesn't exist for me to tell you what it will become. That's how I understand for 48. It's simply, you've experienced reality in the way you've experienced it in this life. You have no clue what reality will be when I get done with where you are going next. One thing for sure is that you will stand before Allah. And when you stand before Allah, you will see that here al Mujrimin, the criminals, very apt for tyrants and their followers. Mukarranina fil asfad. Mukarranina fil asfad literally means, as the study Quran puts it, bound together in fetters. That's a very literal translation. But Mukarranina fil asfad could have another meaning, which I think is more fitting. When you are weighed down when you are uh, 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 tangled up and weighed down by a a thing that would be muqarranina fil aswad so if i you know take a bunch of mice and i pour honey on them so they're all sticky and they're all like they can't get out of the mess they're in. That's Muqarranin of Al-Aswad. I think that the Asfad that the Quran is talking about here is the cumulative impacts of the sin that they've created in the life of Zulamat. When you take the ripple effect of every sin you commit and you experience the full effect of ripple effect and you put the tyrants and their followers together to experience the full weight of the sin it is a, that expression would be a perfect way of describing that image
Sarabiluhum min kutran wa taqsha wujuhum nar. This is 50. Their garments made of pitch. This is again min kutran. A kutran could be um, zift. Um, what's zift? Um, tar. Like a tar pitch. Uh, so it, and 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 literally, it would be oh, they're wearing trousers of pitch or tar or or. Um, but then you'd say, well, what does that mean? They're wearing trousers of pitch. And then in traditional tefasir, say, oh, well, they're wearing trousers of pitch so that they would burn faster. But that that doesn't make a lot of sense either. So, sarabil min qutran. Qutran could be tar, pitch, but it could also be the, it's a it's an idiomatic expression to refer to the darkness and heaviness of sin and wrongdoing, and it's as if they're going to be, and that's why I said that it's like they're all stuck and marred together in their in in the in the consequences of their actions is because they're wearing their sins around their legs and around their hips. They can't move. They're stuck with all the evil that they've committed, personified or exemplified in some fashion. And then it comes at the end and says, هَذَا بَلَاغٌ لِلنَّاسِ وَلِيُنْذِرُوا بِهِ وَلِيَعْلَمُوا أَنَّمَا هُوَ اللَّهُ وَاحِدٌ so this is a balal. This is a proclamation to humankind so that they will teach it to one another and warn another one and one another and to work to implement it. That there is no, and to remember that there is no God but God. And for those who have real intellects to reflect upon and understand. So what is the proclamation? What is so important that it was described as a proclamation? In the word, Surat Ibrahim is a at this point, it's telling Muslims at the time of the Prophet ﷺ and forever, we are about coming out of darkness to light. This is what your father Ibrahim was about. This is what the Prophet Musa was about. This is what you, Prophet Muhammad, is about. Darkness from, from darkness to light means coming out of from tyranny the tyranny of the pharaoh to the light of m to the light of security and safety and peace from the tyranny of justice to the light of justice from the tyranny of lack of ethical principles and lack of moral principles lack of right and wrong because that's what happens in tyranny is that people start learning how to be hypocrites how to lie how to cut corners how everything is vanilla nothing is really black and white corruption 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 the tyranny of corruption itself no no you muslims are not about that Islam can never be about the corrupt city. Islam can never be about the dark city. Remember, I hate to bring this up, but that the idea of the dark cave, the cave of ignorance, existed with Plato. So it is not unprecedented. But what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, the dark cave cannot be Islam. Islam is the illuminated city. 
is the just city, is the secure city, is the safety city, safe city. But in order to have that, you don't kid yourself, you need Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because otherwise, all it takes would be strong wind to blow and you would go back to your relativism and to your insecurities and to your opportunism and to all the awful isms that human beings adopt. Allah is your anchor. Now, what Muslims at this time were becoming aware of is now, if the Hijrah had started or if it was about to start, so Surah Ibrahim is a challenge as to what we have to establish in Medina. But mind you, it resonates throughout history. I submit to you that even the most corrupt Muslims, even, even the Muslims of the Emirat who have sold their soul to the Emirat, and the quietest uh, that follow Hamza Yusuf and Bin Bayya and, you know, Tyrant, that at one time or another, there was one time where they understood when they were studying Islam that Islam was equal to justice and, and luminosity. It, it's innate. They, they were tempted out of it. They became corrupted out of it. But when you're studying, when you first learn the Quran, it is the most natural thing that comes to you. Islam cannot be darkness, cannot be injustice, cannot be tyranny. And then as you get older and then, you know, you, you develop interests and institutions and so on, you start saying, ah, okay, well... You know, maybe that's not that bad. Maybe it's okay here. Maybe a little tyranny is okay. Maybe a little injustice is okay. You, you drift towards the demonic. You drift towards shaitan. But Surat Ibrahim is a stark reminder that the path of shaitan is very different from the path of God. If you want the truth, they're a world apart. And that's Surah Ibrahim, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Okay, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Um, let's actually begin with uh, the dhikr for the chapter. Oh, the dhikr is the very first ayah. كتاب أنزلناه إليك لتخرج الناس من الظلمات إلى النور بإذن ربهم إلى الصراط العزيز الحميد. الحمد لله. Just to say again, um, thank you so much for everything. I mean, this sura is incredible. Um, and I, you know, I, I think that when you when you start reaching like a critical mass, um, they start having such um, an inexplicable, like, visceral impact. Um, because we've heard a lot of the same kinds of messages before, but part of it, too, is, like, when you start hearing it from different angles, different places, different circumstances, and all of that, and it starts coming, the symphony starts coming, and, you know, it, it's, like, um, it's, it's so powerful. And, you know, I try to imagine, like, Okay, these people are about to leave their homeland um, completely um, insecure. They don't know what they are heading to, what they can expect. They know that what they've been experiencing is so bad, it's so dark, that they just have no choice but to leave. But at the same time, it like, um, you know, what a message to be able to say, okay, you know, everything is uncertain, but here's the one thing that's mm -hmm. sure. You know, and it's the one thing that matters. And like when we try to imagine like the application to our life, and especially now it feels like our modern life is so much like that. It's so, so dark in so many ways. It's so uncertain. There's so much um, that is cause for anxiety, um, so little to hang on to, um, and so much injustice. 
that it just it really hammers home the importance again of like the one thing that you can be certain about is God and clarity and and just even like the um, the fact that there is truth there is a difference between right and wrong and you know like, like that like you know even in, in my own personal experiences there have been times where you know you feel so alone and something happens to you that is so horrible and just to feel like okay no one else saw it but God saw it mm. God knew it's you know there is it's you're not alone and there is going to be an accounting is such a source of comfort and strength so to hear it then I mean I can imagine just receiving this is, is just incredibly powerful but anyway but for I mean for us receiving it here it's I don't know how why but it just feels like you know again right and wrong there is a right and wrong forget all the relativism forget all of the the you know ways you can justify this and that the the imagery that um, very, very right after the surah, I mean, the imagery that you find repeated in Islamic literature, so it's clear that it, it got anchored in the Muslim psyche, is the imagery of a shajar al tayyibah that um, the, the goodness as this, as this rooted tree, this lasting tree that uh, sprouts fruit regularly. And so, I mean, it, it was, um, so you have to communicate to the followers of this message, the belief in goodness, and at the same time, the, pa the patience and endurance that the fruit is not immediate. And then the other thing that, actually, I'm, I'm happy what you're saying, because notice that the Prophet Ibrahim السلام, says his prayer about this balad, al-amin, and we can then ask how long it took before you could say that the prayer became true. I mean, you're talking about centuries, centuries in which um, we, we really couldn't say that the Kaaba and Mecca had become a, an, a Balad Amin. And if we say that it it finally comes to fruition at the time of the Prophet ﷺ. Um, and I Amin, mean, it, it doesn't, because a lot of, some, some commentators understood I Amin mean, as basically a safe, but it's not, it's not an issue of, of just safety from invasion. That's not the, the, because sometimes the Kaaba was invaded. And at the time of the Karamita, for instance, it was invaded and the Kaaba was stormed and, and so on, but Amin as as its center for is a a a a kind of meaning, a center for monotheism, a center for belief. Um, that took centuries. So and and that was not lost on Muslim theologians. That when when. When, as we learned in um, Surah Al-Araf, that you know you you have an obligation to perform a law because of the principle as to when that tree will grow and how it will sprout fruit, that you have to leave to Allah. And that's core to the message of Surah Ibrahim. But the but you have to maintain the conviction of of that that belief and understanding of from darkness to light. Um, I was once speaking at an Islamic conference, and I it was uh, a lot of young people, and I I asked 
I quoted some of these verses about darkness lights and I asked people, I asked the, the Muslims present to explain them. And it, not surprising, you know, for a lot of, at least American Muslims, they, they, they had no clue what, what darkness to light means. Um, and that, that's a problem in consciousness because it has to be clear. But when you phrase it that way, um, then you, you put in the heart of the matter these questions about ethics and justice. And it can't just be about laws, but it has to be about ultimate principles and virtues. And and that's badly needed, I mean, um, even among the Muslims today. And did you want to start yourself? In the Fatiha Halakha, which was over 25 years ago, um, actually no, sorry, it wasn't Fatiha, it was the, the Halakha, Surat al-Ikhlas. You said that, um, it's called Hu Allahu Ahad, and you talked about the usage of Ahad, and that because you, you, singular is very different than saying that he's one, because one connotes that there is two, that there is three, that there is four. Right. Um, so I was wondering, in light of that, why then in verse 48 are we choosing Wahid? And does that have, is that related to the fact that it's, is it, I mean, is it related to the larger surah? Is it related to the Wahid of Qahar? Oh, Al Wahid of Qahar. Um, Yeah, the, if it said Allah and Wahid and stopped, then that would pose the problem that you encountered in Qulhu Allahu Ahad. Because then, then the, the, grammatically you would think that, okay, well, there would be a thani, a thalith, and so on. But it says Al Wahid Al Qahar. And in that construct, it's saying it, it, then it would mean there is no other al qahar but that wahid. So it, it just potential of the grammar of it. That so, and and if it. It would not be grammatically correct if you said, Allah, or it would just have a very different meaning if you said Allah al Ahad al Qahar. Then it would be Allah al Ahad, the one, and then al Qahar would be like the Murtada, it would be a, a new beginning. But al Wahid al Qahar, uh, al Qahar al Ma'atuf al Wahid. So it, it, it um, it is like um, saying m meaning wise that if you want to know who the true Qahar is, then it is this Wahid, is this one. Thank you so much for another illuminating tafsir on behalf of my family at least and I'm sure the rest of the group here. Um, thanking you for the tafsir that balances the message of Quran twice a week now for us with the practicality of life. Uh, uh, we're greatly appreciated. Um, on uh, ayah number four, there was a mention of justifying why Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam uh, speak in Arabic, and you then mentioned that uh, 
through the tafsir that um, Allah sends the messenger with the language of the people. Mm. Um, and that's why it's in Arabic. And so we also hear and mm, throughout our life that people ask that, you know, if it was supposed to be a Quran for us, why not in our language? And you also mentioned that, that uh, the whole notion of us speak, speaking Arabic was more of uh, generalizing that everybody that uh, speaks that language is also uh, somehow shares that um, ethnicity in a right. way, that there is no ethnicity per se. There's also the other side of it that um, then why was this revealed um, to the Arabs? And of course there is discussion of that you mentioned this was this came to a culture of um, very little uh, fairness and justice, namely the worst of it being the burial of the, their daughters. Mm -hmm. There is also the argument that Dr. Surush brings out, um, specifically mentioning that the Arabs were chosen because the society was um, somehow free of any philosophy of the time. And so they had then um, no notion of the rationalizing and philosophizing the message of God. Mm -hmm. And it would be then, in a way, purified version would be received by these people. And I wanted to know what your thoughts are on this one argument. Uh, okay, so first, to, to just go back to that, the, the uh, point about the prophet and, and a language is that the prophet is, is sent, or the language that the prophet is sent with is the language is the language of the chosen prophet. So what I was saying is that the, the, it is, it, um, so it is not necessarily that the prophet, is, it, it is not that the target audience matches the language of the prophet, but that simply the, 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 the people that the prophet is from is the language that, that the pro, that is used, um, and since this was an Arab prophet, so that just happened to be an Arab prophet. So it that was the language that was used for the prophet. I mean that's what the, the when the Quran says, "Oma arsalna min rasulin illa bi lisani qawmihi," the qawm, the people of the prophet not bilisan, not with the tongue of whoever, you know, everyone that the Risala is, in, is intended to. Uh, because for instance, like, you know, uh, there, there's a real issue of what language Moses spoke. And although Moses was sent to the Israelites, um, and, a, there were a lot of Egyptians followed him, but there is a lot of speculation that Moses actually spoke um, the language of the pharaohs, and that Hebrew was not a language that even came to the Israelites till after they entered Palestine. Um, Anyway, so th th this issue of, of, of language, I mean, there always had to be a, a choice of whatever language is going to pick, be picked. There always going to be the issue of, well, why that language? And human, unless Allah makes all human beings monotone uh, and, and abolishes language differences, there, there always going to be that that gap in the issue of language. But why the Arabs specifically, I mean, that that's the larger question. There, there are many, I mean, there are many things, and among the arguments that, to an extent, I mean, 
Of course, I mean, not the... Uh, it's been a while since I, I read this at least. I remember reading it in some um, a, a translated book on, from Sarusha's arguments. Um, so some of it's translated. Um, uh, and if I remember, my my reaction to that was that I was wondering what he meant by philosophical outlooks among the Arabs. Um, what is clear is that this plot of the Near East was not under the tutelage of a centralized empire that would have for sure co-opted the Islamic message as happened with Christianity. I mean, although Christianity was sent to the Israelites, once the Roman Empire co-opted that message, it, it became Romanized and it became grafted with the ideology or the, the, the mythology of Roman culture, which was the Trinity. I mean, verbatim type of... And in the case of, uh, you know, on, on the one hand, you had the, the Byzantine Empire centered in Egypt and, and Syria, and the Persian Empire centered in Persia and Iraq, um, and the influence of uh, the Christian Empire of Abyssinia that extended even up to Yemen. So um, there is no the the, the so the, this is one important aspect is that you for that message to sprout you needed um, freedom from centralized tutelage that could have imposed. That's what that could have imposed a, a, a homogeneous influence upon the entire, uh, and and forced everyone to follow a particular theology that is, that would have uh, benefited whatever elite. That's one thing. The other thing is that in Arab society was porous. Uh, wh who got to be a part of? Persian society, who got to be a part of the Byzantine society, or who got to be a part of a lot of the inhabited areas around Arabia, was uh, largely centralized. I mean, you, you couldn't just go and settle in Persia and become Persianized. It, 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 that was not possible. And until the fall of the Byzantine Empire, uh, you couldn't do the same in Egypt. You could go in, you could get permission to trade, you had to pay the taxes to the central authority, you exited with your trade, but you, no one was just simply free to settle or to migrate around. Arabia was di very different. Uh, Arabia was really um, a melting pot because of the system of Mawali. So as long as you got a tribe to say you're under its protection, um, there was a, a very complex and a very chaotic system of um, interlinking, interpersing, crisscrossing, um, sometimes competing uh, loyalties but when when you have uh, when you have that type of chaos you also have a level of freedom because so what that effectively meant is that you had Romans that could come settle in Arabia and be, and and become and, and Islam needed that for for, for it to be able to absorb from a multitude of cultures and be enriched by it, it needed that type of porous freedom 
Uh, so, you, you know, you have the, the Abyssinian like Bilal, you have the Persian like Salman, you have the Roman, um, um, what was it, Suhaib al-Rumi, and, and, and many other Ismistis that came in and, 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 you know, that would just melt into, and especially in areas outside of Mecca like Medina, which, so, the absence of centralized authority, the, the, the phenomena of a melting pot of, of cultures and ethnicities, and language is often um, an egalitarian measure of a melting pot. Because you could learn Persian, but in the, in, during the Persian Empire, uh, regardless of how you, how you spoke Persian, it was clear who had papers, who didn't have papers, who, who was what in the bureaucracy of Persia. And same thing with Byzantium. The, the fact that, um, and for a while, it, it, as remarkable as it sounds now, uh, Arabic was sort of the, the language that everyone learned. It was, uh, and in fact, uh, there is a um, there is an amazing uh, quote um, that I actually cited in one of my articles. I quoted it, where this uh, this um, uh, Christian um, 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 a, a, a priest or something. He's complaining about how the the kids of his age. Who are not who are who are not Muslim? Who are the Christian kids are all learning Arabic. And do you remember? Uh, Paul, Paul yeah, and I quoted it in one of my yeah. publications. I don't remember. Yeah, they're, that they're all learning Arabic, and that how like all everyone who's who's fancy and who's uh, cool is learning Arabic, and and. It, as remarkable as this sounds in our day and age, at a time, remember that Bukhari was not Arab. You know, uh, um, Kassani, the Hanafi scholar, was not Arab. Saraksi was not an Arab. Um, um, got most of the Hadith Nisa'i was not Arab. Uh, Muslim was not an Arab. I mean, so the 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 fact that you could pick up the language and fit in. Uh, was certainly intentional, and because it would have been a very different dynamic if it would have tried to fit within one of the imperial formats that exist, where you know, it, regardless of what language you mastered, your status, whether you're this ethnicity or that ethnicity, would would have been well defined, and well tracked, and well kept. Uh, um, and ultimately, you know, when even when the empire tried to keep it Arab, keep the elite Arab during the Amalites, it it's, it it worked only for the first century, and then after that it crumbled. Um, and most Islamic dynasties, um, where, where you look, if you look in the crumbling after the crumbling of the Abbasid era which of these dynasties were actually Islam, Arab dynasties, and you find very few of them. Most of the dynasties, so even someone like Salah al-Din, who, you know, the conqueror, was not an Arab. Um, all of that, I think, is part of what Allah wants to teach, teach us from history. Um, and, and that's why I find the, the resurgence of the language of ethnicity among modern Muslims so traumatizing because it completely erases all the gains of Islam. Uh, you know, which the, all the rhetoric that you hear from um, The, as to the issue of into intellectual, I'm not sure. I mean, he, here's the 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 
there were philosophical traditions in pre-Islamic Persia, as well as philosophical traditions in Byzantium. But the irony is, is that what reached us about these philosophical traditions only reached us through the filter of the Islamic civilization. Because whatever these whatever texts reached us in the modern age, it reached us because of the translation works by Muslims and because of the rewriting so in the Zoroastrian tradition or the Manchian tradition, a lot of the Manchians and a lot of Zoroastrians started trying to write their tradition in response to the Islamic civilization. It was not written before and not necessarily even preserved before uh, to the same extent. So a lot of what survived that claims to be Manchian philosophies or Zoroastrian philosophies were heavily influenced by Islam. So they, they heavily plagiarized from Islam and heavily plagiarized from the Quran. So the, the, the thing that I know that the Department of the Persian Studies at UCLA doesn't like to hear is that in fact Persian pre-Islamic culture in its pristine unadulterated form is unreachable without without the, the Islamic era. You know they hate hearing that because that that department is very anti-Muslim. And but a lot of what they study as authentically quote unquote Persian is actually heavily influenced by the Islamic tradition. And so when they see things that, oh look, you know, in Zoroastrianism it says something that happens to be very similar to the Quran, well obviously because it was written well after the Quran. Um, and that's, that, that, has, that, that very uncomfortable calligraphic fact that has to do with texts and the, history, history, the dating of texts and what texts survived um, uh, is for a lot of the, the, the nationalists on both sides. You know, history often makes things uncomfortable for nationalistic dogma. So I can't, I mean, I've often tried to imagine if Allah wanted at this late stage pro, I mean, you're talking, you know, so you're talking about post-Jesus era. Uh, if Allah wanted to send a religion, since all the religions seem to be, all the Abrahamic religions are focused in the Near East area, uh, where Allah could have sent it, where it would not be co-opted and corrupted immediately, Arabia would be the ideal spot, simply because n none of the superpowers cared enough about Arabia. It was sort of the ignored backwaters of the world. And, it, you know, it's where wherever the, the people who are really powerful, wherever the elite, wherever the, the their attention is not focused is the most promising place because the elite will, will kill anything that defy challenges them. <clears throat> Any other questions here? Short one? Okay. So I really appreciated the. Um the, the segment about what is wrong with idolatry um, and I was wondering whether um, in you know coherence with that verses 21 and 22 are really interesting and they stuck out a lot um, where essentially the wrongdoers and the tyrants are 
blaming God in essence. When, mm. when they are being blame is placed on them, they say, "Well, don't don't look at us. It's really His fault because mm. He never guided guided us. He didn't do His job." And it's it, you know again skirting accountability. And then immediately I thought, just in my mind, intuitively, Shaitan came next, right? Mm -hmm. Because like, I started to think immediately, Shay Shaitan did the exact same thing. It was like, well, this is all your fault. Yeah, right? but you, 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 and then, then, you know, yeah. not having the verse memorized, I didn't even remember that Shaitan shows up and literally then it's, it, it, so it just struck me as within the, the way that you phrase the irrationality, it's a darkness, right? The irrationality of idolatry. Uh, um, the darkness of irrationality in this sense I was wondering whether it's purpose is this purposefully what Allah is supposed to, trying to say here of he's highlighting um, the irrationality of shaitan you know they're, they're doing the same back to him now and he's saying well why are you blaming me it wasn't my fault yeah. uh, so just yeah, kind of like it, point, so yeah. the ripple effect of the darkness that you were saying thematically yeah. it seemed to like to confirm exactly the theme that you're saying. Yeah, and, and actually, and there is, when we get to the, the issue of the darkness of irrationality, you know, I've always been struck by also the irrationality of tyranny itself. Um, because the, the whole point of tyranny is you have a person or a class of people who are irrationally thought to know best. But then you ask, well, why? I mean, any objective criteria you're going to try to follow as to why they know best, it's going to fail. Because if you say piety, well, how do we know who's most pious? And does this mean if I, if Joe Mo? develops their piety where they objectively can demonstrate that they pray more than anyone else and they fast more than anyone else, the elite are going to invite Joe Mo to come part, be a part of them? It's not going to happen. So if it's a claim of knowledge, specialized knowledge of some sort, again, we get into the same thing. Well, so does this mean anyone that can empirically demonstrate that they have as more knowledge than you? Are you going to tyranny is is in itself irrational and the thing about the demonic and I, and I think I've said this before that the, 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 the nature of demonic the demonic attacks is its irrationality um, when you try when you sit there and you try to see okay does it make logical sense no it doesn't make logical sense and I don't think this is at all a coincidence. I mean, and I wish that modern Muslims, you know, there is a reason that Islam inspired a civilization that sparkled with reason and science and inventions and all of that. And, and I think that a huge part of it is that it got Muslims to value knowledge, value learning, and hate irrationality. Mm -hmm. Of course, that was lost eventually, but but we'll talk about the initial message of the Quran itself, or the message of the Quran. Uh, you know, the 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 that. How more irrational, and you know, this blames this and the blames this and the shaitan blames this. It's like, it, it's it's like um, how petty people act, not how respectable, rational people act, and that's intentional. Interesting. Okay. okay, this is a message from Joe on interactive. Um, this was, I think, one of my favorite halakas yet. I am still processing. Mm -hmm. Firstly, I cannot believe that until now I did not see the obvious linguistic connection in Arabic between darkness, zulmat, and oppression, zulm, hidden in plain sight. It is literally the same root. Right. Z, uh, um, how did I miss this? Um, <laughs> my question is a simple clarification. The professor mentioned at the outset that the prophet Abraham had already been mentioned several times in the Quran 
and yet this is the surah that is named after him. Right. <clears throat> to confirm, my sense from the halakha is that this is because the early Muslims grasped that it is because this surah, not any other, tackles the core underpinning and animating theme, darkness into light, and that all other allusions to the Abraham narrative elsewhere in the Quran are elaborations, variations, or glosses upon um, that central theme. Exactly. Precisely. And very well put. Okay. <laughs> and then Joe has one more question. Bonus. Since you did so well on that first question. Um, another question on verse 22. There is something remarkably honest and candid about Satan in this verse. The pride and arrogance doesn't seem to be there. More of a sense of lament or resignation. Did this verse excite the imagination of commentators? Yeah, yeah. The the they they actually you you read uh, and especially the the books treaties written on um, like for instance the book Talbis Iblis um, um, and even the Mu'tazili book Risalat uh, Iblis, the Khwani al they they sort of because the, here you get a little bit of a layered complexity to the personality of Iblis, and so you know if you know that ultimately you're going to say, you know, I, I've never questioned God's supremacy, then then how is it logical to, to defy and to um and the and I mean this, this is a little bit um more the traditional sort of the, the, the straightforward traditional position is to just say that yeah uh, Iblis is um, is the 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 sort of the, the the example of of pride, who knows that it is very irrational, it's very illogical, who knows that this pride is going to be his undoing, but he does it anyway. Um, the some of the more you know, non-traditional started imagining certain things like that Iblis, it's going to turn out in the hereafter that Iblis actually hopes for Allah's forgiveness. That, um, which I think is interesting, but I, I don't know, I've, I never knew what to think about that. I mean, it sounds pretty... Some even said, well, no, Iblis isn't that. This response by Iblis in Surah Ibrahim is is allegorical. That Allah is saying what Iblis ought to say, not that Iblis will actually say it. And that for we don't know, it might be that Iblis remains defiant till the end. Some of the more outlandish things I've read um, that imagine that Iblis has hopes of of course from a Muslim perspective entirely crazy and insane hopes of somehow um, God, defiance of God continuing on um I'm not, I mean, it, I, I don't want to get into exactly how, because that gets us into some, but yes, it it has, I mean, the the least interesting commentaries are the traditional tafsir. The, you get into more interesting things, especially um, with, you know, Sufi-esque and, and um, orientations or... Um, among poets, theologians, uh, 
books written or treatises written especially on Iblis, they, you know, there aren't too many good modern scholarly works on Iblis in the Islamic tradition. I think there are a couple that were written in, um, in the Orientalist tradition. Um, on the theme of, of darkness to light, can going from darkness to light also mean going from the state of not knowing oneself to the state of self-knowledge? Were prophets essentially beings who called their people to self-knowledge? Um, in the Sufi tradition, absolutely yes. Um, I mean, gen actually, I will even go beyond the Sufi tradition and say, yes, it, it, generally in Islamic theology, the answer would be yes. Um, Surat Ibrahim, we will, we will see other parts or other places in the Quran which deals with the, the theme of darkness to light from a different angle. But Surat Ibrahim, it, it is that that issue of al balad al amin the 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 safe quality the the zulm the the injustice of the pharaoh and oppression and the the ugliness of tyranny um and Subhanallah, I mean, it, it, it is not, um, when, when Muslims understood Surah Ibrahim to be the, the, the Surah deserving of to be named after the Prophet Ibrahim is, you know, the, the, the whole paradigm of what, what is the core mission of Islam and you nearly intuitively say to take people from out of darkness to light. And theologically, that could include a variety of things. But at a social level, at or the level of a, of a polity, from darkness to light would be from ignorance to knowledge, from injustice to justice, from superstition to the opposite of superstition so it, it is it is things that appeal to us even intuitively that we 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 know them intuitively although we often lose sight of them when we instead of sticking to al-qawl al-thabit and shajar al tayyiba we, we start drifting to, you know, laws and details that justify injustice and we relink, we, we say, oh, let's just assume that the law is just and, and not ask the larger question, do we have justice? Okay. Um... I think we have time for one more question, um, but in the in the interim, just to let people know, Surah Ibrahim has not been adopted yet. So, if you want to adopt this one, please do. If you if you it. want to adopt uh, from darkness to light, adopt Surah <laughs> <to> Ibrahim. <laughs> um, okay. So, last question: um, How do you practice gratitude if you suffer from mental illness and personality disorders like chronic depression and borderline personality disorder? No, um, me mental illness is is very serious. People, the you know there there is there is self self um, uh, diagnosed mental illness or or, or self medicated uh, um, medicated mental illness, which is not mental illness at all. Like when people just say, oh, I'm depressed, or oh, I'm this, I'm this, I'm this. But serious mental illness, uh, including um, things like borderline personality or um, um, 
you know, a, a serious depression, which is chemical. Um, it, 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 in the same way, you know, someone who is, is physically ill might not be able to do sujud. And their sujud becomes moving their head up and down, not putting their head on the floor or moving their eyes up and down. Sometimes you're so ill that all you can do is pray with your eyes, not even with anything else. Um, mental illness is a similar condition. It, and, and that's why it, I, I really do believe at least Muslim psychologists who, who have an understanding are very important to explain to someone who's dealing with something like this, for you, gratitude the gratitude that would make sense would be this amount you know something small something that you can actually do like praying with your eyes or praying just with your head when you can't move your body uh, uh, my mother w worked in mental health and the one thing I learned from my mother as she dealt with patients was how deadly serious mental illness is. You know, it, it's, it's no joke, it's no kidding matter. Um, it, it is, it, what mental illness does, it takes away your freedom of choice, your volition. And because it takes away your freedom of choice, then your accountability immediately gets adjusted accordingly. God is just, God doesn't treat someone who doesn't have freedom of choice equal to someone who has complete freedom of choice. God is just. So my advice is um, A, try to find I mean, to the extent possible, if you can find a good Muslim uh, so, uh, professional to help, that would be a great blessing. But if a Muslim doesn't exist, then, then you know, get the best help you, you can, professional help. Two is be kind to yourself and um, define challenges in small steps, don't go to quote unquote imams that have no understanding of mental illness and no rahmah in their heart, no compassion in their heart for people who are suffering the, this most terrible affliction. Uh, go to imams that are human, are humane, that have rahmah and, and have. Uh, that that understand that there that that this is a, a mental illness often is an affliction a hundred times worse than than a physical affliction. Okay, last call. Any comments? Thank you so much. Um, thank you to everyone for being with us for this incredible surah. And I can't believe that uh, we'll be back in a few days. Inshallah. Inshallah. <laughs> so, May Allah give me the strength. If, I don't yeah, know. And, 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 and the water, of course, will help. <laughs> okay, have a wonderful weekend, everyone. And inshallah, we will see you on Tuesday. Okay. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Assalamu alaikum, everyone.